unhealthy amount of non-sleep time this week <laughs> doing the research trying to figure out how all of this actually works and one of the things that i actually got wrong when this all happened and i i was expressing well, what are you talking about they call the house chiefs in or excuse me hereditary chiefs and we all know what that word means it's like the the monarchy it turns out that not all of them are actually hereditary even though they're all called hereditary it turns out it's called the feast system it's very complicated the houses the two or three of them per clan there's five clans in the actual overall area itself have the ability to to name and sort of designate these chiefs based on their merit and they inherit that's where the, the hereditary word comes in the regalia and the title of other people who aren't necessarily directly related to them like parents are uh, in terms of, of going forward. So it's an inherited title, inherited regalia, inherited area of responsibility, but you don't actually inherit it necessarily from one's blood parents. But in other situations, in other nations, hereditary means hereditary. So this is why I think we in the media have such a tough time trying to figure this out, because we know that there are activists out there that just don't want the pipeline to go forward. That's it. Uh, you know, the environmentalists, the reason they've signed on is because LNG is bad, fracking is bad, we want to stop the pipeline, we want to stop greenhouse gas emissions. The problem, though, is that trying to figure out what the actual issue is, which is have indigenous nations been properly respected and consulted here, I, I don't actually know. It's been a week, and I don't know what's true. It, the more I look at it, the more confused I get. Like, and I still remember, I was, what do you mean hereditary doesn't mean hereditary? They were saying the word hereditary for the last five days. You look, well, we didn't mean hereditary as in hereditary. We meant hereditary as in hereditary. I'm like, oh, well, that's, well, that's, Perfect. Not, well, that's clear. Like, like, we don't even know what the issue is. No wonder the governments are having problems striking deals here. And the problem is when you have this hard time understanding what the truth is. People are able to make up their own truth and spread that, which is sadly something I'm seeing. First off, I have one yeah, observation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Orca protest. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, this, this all happened very I quickly. I like the whales. They, they're really maybe, well constructed. Maybe they just didn't have time to make new signs. So like, oh, this arrest just happened. We did a protest right now. Hey, we got these whale signs. I'm being facetious. I don't <laughs> well, actually mean that. But uh, here's the other thing I'm finding yeah. is that, and I think I had a big rant about this uh, on this very show some time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always feel like the environmentalists need to be the good guys. But they are always, in my mind, not all of them, but you know, some of them. They're, 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 it's too easy for them to latch on to some of the half truths and grabbing on to an issue to try to further their agenda in ways that I think makes them lose credibility. And that makes me sad because I kind of the you know the the 19 year old college student in me wants the environmentalists to do well. But when they start doing things like a lot of Facebook uh, messages that I was noticing over the last little while, uh, slamming the government and the corporate media, don't believe them, they're all lying, there's this UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights and they're trampling on the indigenous rights of these Which, people. Which, by the way, is not binding. Yeah. It's not a binding and document. Canada, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the hereditary well, chiefs have Canada not signed on to this. They will support it. it actually, they will. will. They will. And here's the thing. The conditions in the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, those are political conditions because political promises have been made. They don't exist in any law. No court will actually enforce the conditions in that document. Also, even if they did, and this is something I never see, there's a limiting clause written into the document itself. It's Article 46, Subsection 1. It says, among other things, that nothing in this document should be seen to encourage or justify any action that, among other things, at least partially impairs the political unity of a country or impairs the territorial integrity integrity of a country exactly that's why laws for eminent domain exist that's why laws for expropriation exist can i just finish my point yeah oh, go sorry, back sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, i thought that, that was, was your point, point. I, thought, I'm you sorry, I thought that was your point no no that was just one of them oh, okay. i was just saying these these posts that are saying look we've got yeah. this this uh first nations rights getting trampled on and uh, slamming the government and the corporate media and all of this uh, for, for that reason, when they don't even really have an understanding of it, I don't think it's about the First Nations' rights. They, you know, there's an environmental uh, crusade here to try to stop the pipeline, and that's fine. But if you start latching onto things and throwing things that you don't understand out there, or filling that vacuum of understanding with your own facts, then I think that causes you to lose credibility, and it just makes me sad because I would love those those uh, activists to be fighting on on some facts on some truth and winning on that rather than trying to play the dirty game which uh, bothers me and then you see the the protest march same thing like the, if if you're not organized on the right information and then people who i think are able to critically think for themselves will look at that and go oh well i you're you're marching with a bunch of orca whales and we're talking about a 
landlocked a pipeline. Gas, yeah, 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 a natural well, gas pipeline. Well, there, there will be ships eventually. Sure, eventually, but, but in a different area. But, you yeah, the yeah. southern residents are, yeah, those are the northern residents. They're actually yeah. doing, all right, so quick break. We'll take some calls as well. It's Roundtable on CFAX 1070. You saw the protesters. Ladies and gentlemen, I am being completely honest with you when I say even now I do not know exactly what is true in this. There are all sorts of positions being put forward. There are all sorts of claims being made. They are contradictory in some cases. They overlap in other cases. Some of the hereditary chiefs are hereditary. In other cases, hereditary doesn't mean hereditary. And it's... Um it's a jumble. We're going to figure out the truth, though. We're going to talk to experts. I've invited some experts to come on the show next week. We're not leaving it anywhere. We'll continue our conversation after this. You've made the decision to go green, clean, and back to the basics. Now choose Integrity Sales to help you manage your organic yard, garden, or farm efficiently. It's where the organic professionals shop. And just like the pros at Integrity Sales, you'll find the highest quality organic fertilizers, soil amendments, micronutrients, and foliar spraying materials that will enhance soil and plants. Integrity Sales for traditional, transitional, and organic gardeners and farmers. 2180 Keating Cross Road where the professional shop. All over Canada, people are proudly driving their F-150s, and now is your chance, too, during the Ford year-end clear-out. Get a 2018 F-150 with best-in-class towing and fuel efficiency. Right now, get over $9,000 in rebates, plus a $1,000 bonus on select new 2018 F-150 models. But hurry, the Ford year-end clear-out ends January 31st. Visit your local Ford store or find your Ford.ca for details. We have always looked to the stars. January on Crave. hey -o. Exploration with a new season of Star Trek Discovery. Wherever our mission takes us, we'll try to have a little fun along the way. Investigation with a new season of True Detective. I want to know the whole story. And inebriation with new episodes of Letterkenny. Bottoms up, Super Chieftain. Plus big movies with numbers in them, like Ocean's 8 and Sicario 2. Adios. Every month brings great new stuff. Only on the all-new Crave. Subscribe now at Crave.ca. Resolution advice from Sleep Country. In 2019, get better sleep for improved concentration, energy, focus. Just this morning, I stayed alert through a whole documentary about how cardboard is made. Thanks to the Boxing Week sale ending soon at Sleep Country. It's not too late to get amazing deals on mattresses. Plus, get a Hot Buy Queen mattress wrapped in aloe vera fabric and Cool Sense gel for just $3.79. Just like cardboard, this won't last long, so don't miss out. It all ends Tuesday at Sleep Country. All for sleep. This Bell Media station believes in being accountable to you, the listener, which is why we participate in the Canadian Broadcast Standards Council. We're committed to upholding the highest standards of broadcast excellence and adhering to the codes of conduct administered by the CBSC. If you have a concern about something you heard on our station, contact us or the CBSC at P.O. Box 3265, Station D, Ottawa, Ontario, K1P 6H8, or visit the CBSC's website at cbsc.ca. So Watsky sign off on CTV News Vancouver Island. Expect the unexpected with stories from local places and faces. Online at ctvnewsvancouverisland.ca. Hi, Jeffrey here for Barclays Fine Jewelers. We want you to start the year looking and feeling great. So now until the end of the month, we offer your diamond jewelry a complimentary spa treatment. Each piece will receive a rejuvenating rub on the polishing wheel, luxurious soak in our ultrasonic bath, followed by a steam. We'll also check for any loose stones. Your treasured pieces will be ready for you the next day at no charge to you. We call it Shine and Sparkle, and we look forward to seeing you here at Barclays Fine Jewelers in Oak Bay Village, online at barclaysjewelers.com. Pure Day Spa, where to go for family aesthetics. You have a favorite mechanic for your car, dentist for your teeth, and advisor for your finances. But who's taking care of your greatest asset? Your skin and body. Pure Day Spa's estheticians, laser, nail, and massage techs, and electrologists have the experience and technology to make you feel and look your best. Pure Day Spa at beautiful Maddox Farm in Cordova Bay. More at purevictoria.com. <laughs> This is Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. You know, the, the worst part, the hardest part for me to try to figure out what has been happening with this controversy with the RCMP moving into the checkpoint at the Unistoten camp is seeing all of these people out there. and Everybody says they know what's going on, 
But a lot of people are either mistaken or they're saying what they wish was true instead of what's actually true. A lot of experts, yeah, they're experts, and yeah, they're telling you the parts that they want you to know about, but there's other parts that you find when you go and you look things up yourself. I don't actually know what is true, and, and we're still trying to find that out. By the way, just for, for everybody's benefit, um, our producers sent out an invitation to some experts from the University of Victoria today. I'd like to have them on the show next week to have a calm, very deliberate um, conversation where we can go through and talk about the differences in the in the structures here. You know, the difference between indigenous chiefs and traditional chiefs, and elected councils and elected chiefs, and even some of the indigenous chief, or excuse me, hereditary chiefs aren't actually hereditary, and how that doesn't make them less or more valid than if they had been hereditary. Like it's it's so complicated, and I think that's why or what contributes to a lot of the misunderstanding here is I'm having a difficult time. Like earlier this week, I thought hereditary meant born, so I'm like, okay, well, it's born. You know, we we know we we can relate to that. And I said, no, 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 Adam. Mo the, yes, there are hereditary hereditary chiefs, but these hereditary chiefs, these house chiefs, no, they're not hereditary. They actually get the title bestowed upon them by their house. And I'm like, well, what do you mean hereditary it doesn't mean hereditary? So we're gonna. We put out some invitations. We're going to get some experts on. We're going to get to the bottom of this one way or the other. Catherine, you wanted to jump in on what Ryan had to say. Absolutely. Piggybacking on what Ryan was saying, there there is a lot of confusion and a lot of misleading information that was coming up from the protest up north. Some of the things that I heard so far was that there was a cell phone blocker. That wasn't true. Supposedly, yeah. Supposedly. RCM, well, yeah, supposedly everybody's cell phones stopped working. The RCMP says that wasn't us. So, I don't exactly. know, maybe, maybe space aliens did and it. Like, I don't know. Mm. The next thing I heard that was police were dressed like militants. That was not true. They were dressed in normal gear, and they had winter clothing on. But So somebody uh, blew that out of proportion. The emergency response team was there. Just to be clear, so yeah. there was tactical gear there. They were dressed in tactical, but they weren't the Canadian forces, though. They weren't the military. Yeah, they weren't the military. That was the other thing. Is somebody said that the military had been secretly deployed up there. I went, okay, yeah. one, if troop transports had gone back past there, the media would have seen them. If they airdrop them in there, which would be ridiculous, by the way, in terms of resources being expended, somebody would have seen some of the transportation aircraft. So, like, there was so, it's almost like the fog of war, but for information. And, and, and even when we think we know what's true, like hereditary meaning born, it's not true. And I just, yeah, I don't so, even know what to do. Of course people reacted, because if you hear things like they were blocking our cell phones and there was military there, of course you're going to be like, what are they doing to these poor First Nations? The uh, Unisotan camp on its Facebook page, the day before yesterday, did a post saying that the RCMP have a secret jet boat that does not need much water. And they, can, and they said that they believed that the RCMP were going to use their secret jet boat to come up the river and sabotage some of their buildings. Now, I know a little bit about police procurement and the resources that RCMP have at their disposal. I am not aware of any stealth jet boat that is in possession of any police force here in Canada. In fact, procurement is generally a very difficult thing for any vehicle. Um, so it was at that point that I kind of realized that you know, we can't just take everything that's coming out of this on face value in terms of information. You know, everything has to be double-checked, triple-checked. And that's really difficult for us in the media because we are accustomed to having certain people that we can go to, have them tell us what's going on, and we just trust them instead of having to cross-examine them. And the problem with this new age of misinformation is that there are no completely objective and, and, and fully honest sides. Everybody's torquing it. Everybody's advancing a position. And I honestly don't know who to believe anymore. It's like the sevenfold increase thing with the tankers. We just repeated it for years, not realizing that, oh, yeah, it's sevenfold for, for Canada, but if you count the U.S. tankers as well, um, it's, it's hardly an increase at all in terms of the number that come in and out. It's about like 436 came in and out of the Strait of Juan de Fuca in the year 2016. There's going to be an extra tanker per day if Kinder Morgan goes for it. It's exactly the same problem, but we've realized that it's everywhere. So I, I don't know what to do about this. I really don't. And you, you know, in terms of the, the, the actual response by the RCMP, I mean, you have to think logically. They're way out in the middle of nowhere. They need the resources they might need to be close by. Well, yeah, so you can't think, just show up with two police cars. Imagine, And then yeah. four hours later, the rest of the crew show up if something happens. Imagine if something happens, not saying it would have, but if, and they didn't have 
all the things they needed. I mean, think of how they would be slammed for going in unprepared, and how dare you risk the lives of these That's officers. Right. That's right. Uh, so, on, yeah, so, so like they, so they've got to take precautions. They do. You have to look at this logically. They weren't there to, to, to burn down a community. They were just extra prepared for an eventuality that could have well, occurred. Well, and that's actually one of the pieces of misinformation that came out, is there was a fire that was started as all this was happening. Initial reports from the scene suggested that the police were lighting things on fire. And I said, no, I refuse to believe that. That's yeah. wrong. Turns out it was the protesters had set the second barricade on fire to try to stop the progression of the police. But once again, all of this gets out onto the internet and social media, and people don't know if it's true mm -hmm. or not, and it bounces around, and it's I just, yeah, we live in an age where it is very, very difficult to figure out what is true. And mm -hmm. people see things, and you see little old lady uh, indigenous grandmothers getting arrested by RCMP. And, of course, anger rises in your heart. Of course you want to go to the streets and protest that. But then you look at what's actually happened, and it's, oh, it's, it's a lot more complicated, and I don't know who to believe. Let's go to uh, caller. John is up. Uh, hey, John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, my wife and I went to a lecture yesterday at UVic about this very topic you're talking about. Yes. <clears throat> and this PhD student from Toronto basically had no solution to anything. He uh, basically painted a dog's breakfast of uh, lack of discipline, lack of control, lack of, of uh, you know, finality on any of this land claims system just in the province of British Columbia, yeah. uh, partly because of our history that we didn't deal with this problem 100 years ago no. so that's part of the problem but right now i think that people should just focus uh focus away from this and understand that there's no law or order taking place um anywhere in bc on any of these issues of land claims and in this particular uh, natural gas project two chinese companies are the largest shareholders okay yes yeah. and um what's to stop them from packing up and walking away taking their toys and going home right nothing nothing uh, nothing yeah. at all and, uh, and of course last week the chinese landed a, a probe on the dark side of the moon never done before mm -hmm. china china's also angry with canada over that uh, huawei lady being held in house detention of vancouver for to be dealt with by american justice at some point in the future yes china is fit to be tied with us and the chinese pull out of bc on this pipeline Line thing, then, uh, then you know, our, our future as an industrial power uh, around the world is, is tarnished for decades to come. Uh, people have to see the bigger picture, and these these uh, land claims issues are not going to be solved in anybody's lifetime. Listening to this show today, okay? Mm. And so, why don't they just set the whole thing aside, build the pipeline, get the money coming in, and deal with this stuff later? Because otherwise, uh, if we just we are setting up roadblocks ourselves we're setting ourselves up for failure we're running for cover we have politicians who just are are just we using weasel words and silliness to dodge the issue and this, this parade of, of losers just carries on down the, the dusty road to nowhere john thank you for the call i think there are many citizens out there that share views similar to john's we will take a quick break continue our conversation in just a moment time now for the news if it's happening it's here CFAX 1070. Good morning, I'm Lisa Best with your CFAX 1070 News to 930. Saanich police are looking for more witnesses to a dangerous driving incident Tuesday night on Royal Oak Drive. It happened around 830. An officer was driving west in the 1100 block when he spotted a 2017 black Ford Fusion heading in the other direction near Lockside Elementary. In an attempt to overtake another vehicle, the Fusion was doing 70 kilometers over the speed limit. A sergeant, a staff sergeant Jeremy Leslie says the officer was forced to take evasive action when the car crossed into the path of oncoming traffic. About a block away is the intersection of Royal Oak Drive and Cordova Bay Road, and that vehicle had actually ended up leaving the roadway after it tried to negotiate a, a curve in the road and ended up crashing. We were able to identify the, the driver, who was a 21-year-old Saanich man, and he was arrested at the scene for dangerous driving. Sergeant Leslie says it's lucky no one was injured. There were pedestrians in the area at the time. The driver's making a court appearance next month. Santa Ysidro Park staff have had their hands full when they had to pick up someone else's trash earlier this week at Mount Doug. What's supposed to be a green space has become a garbage lot. Someone dumped all kinds of furniture in the woods about 50 feet off the trail. Andrew Berger with Santa Ysidro Park says this kind of dumping is on the increase. Over the last few years, it's definitely increasing in frequency. Uh, definitely weekly, sometimes daily. It depends on time of year. Um, but our budgets and the amount we spend of taxpayer dollars is climbing, climbing, climbing. 
He says there's been a lot of plant thefts in Sandwich Parks as well, particularly edible mushrooms and greens like fiddleheads. Berger says many people may be dumping in parks because of the cost it would take to take the items to an actual dump. And as the U.S. president edges closer to declaring a national emergency to fund his long-promised border wall, the House has voted to ensure that all federal employees will be paid retroactively after the partial government shutdown ends. Washington is close to setting a dubious record for the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. That would come tomorrow. The bill passed required all employees, including those who have been furloughed, to be paid as soon as possible once government reopens. More than 800,000 workers, more than half of them still in the job, missed their first paycheck today since the stoppage began on December 22nd. Your CFAX forecast, we've got a chance of showers still to come this morning, mainly cloudy this afternoon, a high of 11 expected. Partly cloudy tonight, down to 5, mainly sunny tomorrow, high of 11 again. More sunshine on Sunday with a high of 8. Right now, in downtown Victoria, it's partly cloudy and we're holding at 7. I'm Lisa Best. If it's happening, it's here on CFAX. It's 9.33. More local coverage than anyone else. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. Now, Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. All right, we're back on the air. We're going to shift to our next topic. Whether or not we'll ever see anything happen with the Malahatter, we'll just keep discussing it until we all die of old age. I uh, want to get, take one more call, though, before we shift topics. Susan has been waiting. Susan, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, guys. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thanks, Happy New Year. Thanks very much for having this uh, discussion. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, for the average person who's working extremely hard uh, every single day, nine to five, kids to take care of, the lovely commutes and, you know, traffic jams that we get caught up in, this particular topic is unbelievable we have been it's 2019 we have been here umpteen times in bc over the last 100 years what is consistently missing in my view mm -hmm. for the average citizen mm -hmm. is information as you've said it's very confusing my expectation of my government all levels is to provide me with appropriate information yet they don't so there is a vacuum, and we are forced to look at what is available, i.e. Facebook and, yeah. you know, fake news and so on and so forth. The government and the company has the resources to uncover and provide that information, and yet they don't. That's, that's an interesting point, Susan. Thank you for that. It is. Um, it is an interesting the point. The problem, though, is that even if that does happen, we have been socialized and taught to not believe the government or the companies because companies are evil right like they, it really like that's that's the narrative that's put out there is oh don't believe them they're an oil company they're not going to tell you the truth we'll tell you the truth and then it turns out nobody's really telling the truth in terms of an accurate point of view and then people like me just sit there and go well, who, i don't even know who to believe here how am i supposed to learn about something when i've got two t uh, i've got 15 teachers telling me different things and some of them are right some of them are not right i don't know when i don't know where and i just yeah I, mean, so, I think people you know what maybe the government does need to step up and provide information for people. This is a resource that has been vetted by experts. This is what we're providing. Here's this point of view. Here's that point of view. Surely we can do better than we are now because there is a vacuum. We don't even know where to turn to yeah. for information. And yeah, and I just yeah, I don't I don't know if anybody knows. That's the actual problem here is that you ask five different academics, you get five different answers because these issues. And let's so have those five different answers. <laughs> but at least we've yeah. got academics speaking on an issue that they know something about. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, thank you for that, Susan. And we're going to, I've, I've sent out some invitations as of this morning, so I hope that some experts from UVic will be able to join us next week to sort of go through the, the intricacies of this. By the way, the way that this story has ended for the moment is the blockade back down. Mm -hmm. The, um, the Unistotan uh, hereditary chiefs, it was, um, his name's John Ridsdale, is, is his English name. His hereditary name, I believe, is Chief Namox, is, is the name. Now, that doesn't mean that he was born into that role. It means that he was 
it's complicated. We'll get into it later. My point is, is that right now, my understanding is that nobody's going to be hurt. Police are cooperating. Everybody's cooperating. The workers will be allowed to do the preliminary work that they're allowed to do. The court injunction is being obeyed. So that's what actually matters right now. So it seems that what had been it, we will stand up to the state and get dragged away, et cetera, et cetera. They've backed down. They're letting the police in. I think that's a smart thing to do. If Now, they might have a legitimate legal claim. Like I said, it's so complicated. I don't know which way is up. But the place to determine that is in a courtroom, not in press releases and Facebook videos and all of this other stuff that flies around these days. So, all right. Speaking of never-ending conversations where we never seem to get anywhere, the Malahat was in the news again this week. It started with Sonia Furston out talking about the problems her constituents have with no emergency route. We had several closures at the Malahat. Uh, one of them lasted the better part of a day, uh, and it really impacted Cowichan Valley, Vancouver Island, low, you know, Southern Vancouver Island, Victoria people. And it really hit home that that artery, the Malahat, when it is shut down, it literally paralyzes. Not everyone, though, in agreement. Some people say that that is just part of living on an island. Councillor Ben I said earlier this week on with Mark Brennan. We live on an island. We live on an island with very hilly topography. Anyone who's driven up island knows that right at Goldstream uh, River, there's a pinch point. Uh, we already have a highway encroaching right through that provincial park by the river through the old growth trees. Uh, I personally think that's, that's enough encroachment. Um, a part of the, the inconvenience of living on an island in this hilly sort of mountainous area is it's less convenient to get around than it would be if we were in Toronto or Seattle or Los Angeles where they've basically paved paradise. And, and I, from the people I talk to who live here, they don't want us to pave paradise. They live here because we're close to nature. So it's a beautiful place to live. Uh, and they want us to look after the environment instead of destroy it. So there we go. Two different views. Two very similar parts of the political spectrum, I might add. Mike Kozakowski, your thoughts on what the people want in terms of an alternate route on the Malahat? Yeah, you know what the people want? They want a proper road. It's, it's a scary road to drive. You ask a lot of folks out there, and they have no choice but to drive the Malahat. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they hate it. And every year, people die on that highway, regardless of, of the pinch points we're talking about, regardless of whether or not we live on an island, which is a massive island, by the way, a tremendously large island. Well, really, in the isn't of... everywhere an island? <laughs> like, really, if you, if you want to get technical, isn't everything an island? Everything it's just some is of them are island. really, really big. You're absolutely. And here's the thing. We have logging roads that are crisscrossing yeah. what we call paradise. They're already there. They've been they 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 they've been built. They so were, yeah, you don't have to cut down a bunch of trees or carve it out. To. You can no, it's follow one of those routes. Out. It's already carved out. But now what's hang on because there's one I can't remember the name of it. There's a sort of infamous one that uh, is out somewhere that way that that already the does Niagara the route. Main. Niagara Main. Thank Niagara you for the name. Thank yes. you. Yes. yes. Now what, what do, you, do you think it's going to be something like that? Like they they've said they're doing the study and that preliminary work could begin in what is it the summer? Like we'll we'll let you know what's happening in the spring. We'll start the work in the summer. So they've already must have some sense of what they're going to they do must. and it must be something that's pretty easy to do if they're saying, hey, we're going to start the work in the summer. So I was wondering, do you think it could be that road or something like that, some sort of logging road that already exists that we're just going to pave up and we'll, we'll, we'll open up the gate when there's a crash and you can use it when that happens? Mm -hmm. uh, you do know, you think I, it's going to be something like that? I, I, I think that would be the most logical solution. However, that road does go through the CRD watershed. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a political quagmire that we're going to have to deal with uh, if we want to use that road. However, here's the thing, is there's already a new road that was recently paved on the Malahat parallel to the actual highway. It's known as Goldstream Heights Road. Mm -hmm. And it extends quite far south, right down to just about the Langford border, and the couch and Langford border along the highway. A lot of people don't know that Langford actually extends up the Malahat a certain way. So that road's already been paved. A portion of it is newly paved. And extending that newly paved section to a portion of Niagara, Maine, is not exactly a tremendous feat. Okay, so, so we're already partway there. Combining a couple of combining routes like the that. Two, and Goldstream Heights Road connects with Shawnigan Lake Road. Shawnigan Lake connects to Mill Bay via Shawnigan Lake. So you, you've already got that route mostly developed. You just have to a matter of plugging a few holes. Connect up. a few holes. And to me, like, it's not, it's not the big extra highway that everybody would like. Everybody would like an, a, an extra route that you can take and sure. take some of the pressure off. 
but at least it's something. It's, it's an something. emergency to yeah. keep people from having to go through a three or, or four hour and detour do the circle route yeah. via Port Renfrew. It, it, it seems like a compromise. It's Catherine? kind of ridiculous that if something happens on the Malahat, the island basically screeches to a halt. It shuts yeah. down. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. So to, to at least have another pressure valve that you could let off that that seems to make sense to me and it's if it's not uh, like like we said if it's not carving a whole new six lane highway through through the rainforest you know i i can see why some people wouldn't like that i mean you know you can disagree with it if you want but i can see why the ben isaacs of the world would have a legitimate thing to say look i don't think we should be cutting a bunch of our old growth forest through a watershed to do it but if it's just stitching a few already existing roads together here can you, they kind of lose some of the argument I well think. here's the thing i think the ben isaacs of the world and uh and i don't mean this as a disparaging comment towards mr isaac but the ben isaacs of the world have a position they need to maintain so regardless of what the solution might be their position is to say what they say and that's never going to change. In, yeah, I, I can see what you mean. In terms of politics, it's the job of everybody to stake out a position and put forward their position to the best of their ability. But that doesn't mean that anybody ever expects to always get what they want. Yes, exactly. It's, it's the sort of, it's the, you know, the prosecution and the defense in our adversarial legal system. Uh, there's no expectation that the prosecution will always win. There's no expectation that the defense will always win. And all parties involved know that. It's not the job of the defense to play the role of prosecutor. It's not the role of prosecutor to play the role of defense. What we see in our politics is a lot of role playing, quite frankly. So exactly. Are, yeah. So are these ideas practical in terms we can actually do them? Mm, probably not. But do the, are they supposed to be, or is this supposed to be part of the thrust, the grappling, if you will, of finding a solution, Catherine? And we should also look at solutions of multimodal transportation. I know that it it sounds dead, but it's not dead. The E and N railway is yeah. still an option. <laughs> well, They're still talking about it. There okay. was a meeting about it. I in know. December. I know. I know. But what that you know, if that was something else they could roll out, they've got all of these almost there things. They've got this rail line unused. They've got, like we said, these roads that are well, almost there. Well, the trestles there. up there. It's really nice to walk on the yeah, trestle absolutely. up there for the e &N. One of them actually sways. There's two trestles. Really? Yeah. Okay, well, well don't, don't walk on the sway. Yeah, I don't like don't, the one that sways. Don't drive on the sway. It's not one. good. But if, the but if the government wanted to, they could write a big check and fix that thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, highway 1 is a federal highway. Yeah. Why, are, why, why isn't the Trudeau government coming down here saying, look, folks, okay, we have half a million people on the South Island and another half a million more or less north of the South Island. Uh, we need a better route. And I think Sonia first now said in, that in the feasibility study, these things are going to be looked at. Yeah, yeah I true. hope so. And, and I hope this study actually leads to actually uh, uh, something tangible. Not, not like I, not another know, study. Poor, poor Mayor Stu Young, he's got a room where he keeps studies in because they pick up so much study. <laughs> did, you see, did you see those pictures on CTV News earlier this week? He brought out all the studies and put them together, and it's it's like a room filled with binders. That's amazing. It's, it's ridiculous. That's amazing, yeah, yeah. No, we've been doing studies for years. We've got to do another one. I tell you, I'm in the wrong industry. I should be in the study industry. Study industry. Uh, let's take a quick break. Calls after this on Roundtable. From the CFAX 1070 Community Cruiser, here's what's happening. On Sunday, February 3rd, the Fairmont Empress Hotel will be hosting the second annual Shine Fashion Tea in support of BC Children's Hospital. Tickets are on sale today. January 11th marks the 12th annual Shoot for the Cure Games at Ubix Carson Gym. Come support your Ubix Bikes basketball teams while raising funds and awareness for the Canadian Cancer Society. Watch for the CFAX 1070 Community Cruiser from Canvas Acura. CFAX 1070. Todd Talbot here for VGH Millionaire Lottery. Don't wait any longer. Absolute fun. Final deadline, midnight tonight. A multi-millionaire lifestyle of your choice awaits you. Choose from eight grand prizes, including 2.7 million cash. Somebody's going to win millions. Why not you? We all need VGH, and VGH needs you. Buy now before it's too late. Absolute final deadline, midnight tonight. Tickets in London Drugs or MillionaireLottery.com. 19 plus to play. Know your limit. Play within it. Sunwing's popular million dollar beach blowout sale is back. We've been able to find the best deals and save our customers millions of dollars on vacation packages to top rated resorts at our most popular destinations. Now is the perfect time to vacation better with our best price guarantee and award winning service every step of the way. Book by January 11th with your travel agent or Sheila, and I've been volunteering at the Royal Museum shop for eight years. 
When I retired from a career in retail, I still wanted to deal with people and products I care about. This was the perfect fit. And the fact that profits benefit the museum, well, that's icing on the cake. Visit the volunteers at the Royal Museum Shop. All proceeds support the Royal BC Museum. Or shop online and connect on social media. The Royal Museum Shop. Intriguing and unique. Parker Johnston Roofing has taken care of Victoria's residential roofing needs since 1950. That's nearly 70 years and three generations of experience they use to complete any project. Being in the roofing business for that many years has taught them that employing only certified and skilled family-friendly employees results in a better experience for all concerned. Visit ParkerJohnstonRoofing.com for more information or to contact them for a free estimate. Parker Johnston. What does it take to operate a farm? Commitment to a lifestyle, hard work, practical knowledge of the basics? The friendly folks at Integrity Sales get it. So you can count on Integrity Sales to have what you need when you need it. No call center, just good old-fashioned personal service and trusted expertise. Whatever you need for your farm, from new turkeys and chicks to large animal feed and equipment to ease the chores, expect the best at Integrity Sales. 2180 Keating Cross Road, where the professionals shop. Looking for a little alone time. What's not to love about these dysfunctional families? Yeah! First up, the Connors. Hey, we have a winner! The number one new comedy on television. Now you're just pulling stuff out of thin air. Followed by... The kids are all right. Is that a microwave oven? You know, cut your cooking time in half. You had a chance to cut my cooking time in half four kids ago. The kids are all right. It's food! And the Connors. <laughs> streaming back to back. Watching TV from the porch. Cool. It all starts Tuesday at 8 on CTV. I'll call you if I need you. It's Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. Oh, well, poor Mayor Stu in Langford is going to have to clear some space out of his study room for some more binders. Uh, they're doing the multimodal lower island transportation. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to give the government a hard time about doing studies. You know why? Because when they're doing studies, they're not causing constitutional crises. They're not breaking proportional representation for a recommendation. This government wants to take some time to maybe breathe in, breathe out. Mentally visualize water softly flowing over a rock. Maybe some, <laughs> maybe some mindfulness while we do some studies instead, they of love break, their studies instead of breaking everything. I'm okay with studies. You know, I'm fine. Yeah, let's do a study. Nothing gets broken when we do a study. That's why it's okay. I'm okay with it because of that. Let's go to our callers and see what Scott thinks. Scott, you're on the air. Go ahead. Good morning, Adam. Morning. Uh yeah, I mean, I uh, I worked on that stabbing or that uh, Goldstream Heights paving program a couple months ago. Yeah, and it is it is paved um, halfway down, if not three quarters of the way down now. And I work with the fella. His family owns the last hundred plus acres. Yeah, um, that almost goes down to uh, Ma Miller's there. That that butts right in. Oh yeah. So it'd be very easy. You could open that up in a couple months. If you uh, finished paving the rest of the road, and then you'd cut off right where Ma Miller's is, um, you know where that all that new uh, construction is in there past West Hills, and that could be an alternate route up and running extremely quickly um, if they wanted. And it's below the watershed. Everyone talks about yeah, cars it is driving through our our water system. Well, obviously that's not going to happen. This is below the watershed so you're not affecting water doesn't flow up hills it flows down hills so um there's no issue there whatsoever and they're they're open to sell they actually had people come through the property unexpected yeah. i guess surveyors and had a look at it oh that's interesting that's a very yeah. interesting nugget of information scott appreciate that scott talking about the route and he thought that was awesome scott scott thank you so much for that i've been <laughs> i've mentioned this to a few people over the last few weeks like you're nuts mike kozakowski you don't know what you're talking about i said no i think there's some merit here so scott thank you i will i will i will record what you just said I will play it back to everybody. <laughs> well, hey, you know what? It, it, but later in the summer, when when we were all sitting around this table before we knew what the government was going to do, and if it, it turns out that they announced, yeah, we're just going to like stitch together a few roads, like like where Scott just talked about, yeah. we'll be like, hey, we call it first in January, right Jan here on the round January table. January eleventh, which yeah. is actually Sir John A. Macdonald Day today, by the way. Is it? Uh, for those of you, who funny that nobody's celebrating that this oh, year. I was, I was going to say. <laughs> I was gonna say uh, <laughs> Not, uh, not yeah. something that most people will talk about today, but it is it is Sir John A. Day, so we'll remember that. On Sir John A. Day, we called it. 
Yeah. Hopefully. Maybe, Probably. They'll, they'll, maybe they'll find the statue that's hidden in whatever undisclosed bunker that it's in right now and give it a little cupcake or something. Maybe they'll Happy install it along the route. A little yeah. candle. Well, that's one of the things that our, our city council is supposed to be looking at is recontextualizing the statue mm -hmm. of Sir Johnny MacDonald. And, yeah, good luck, right? I still don't think we'll ever see it again. Do we include the raging alcoholism in the uh, reimagining well, of John A. McDonald's? That is, that is the thing. Is that the, the, <laughs> founders, idea. the founders of this nation, much like all politicians, much like all leaders, were flawed people. They made mistakes. They did things wrong. They were never the, the myths that no. they have become. But on the other hand, they they weren't history's greatest monster either. You know, like one of the things that really irked me was comparisons that were made between the father of Canada and the father of the Third Reich uh, during the, the debate that we had over the statue. And I thought that's that's absolutely ridiculous. That's offensive. You know why? Because the sons of Canada fought, bled, and died to put the sons of the Third Reich in the ground. Mm -hmm. Canada made the world a better place eventually. Yes, there have been mistakes made, but what would eventually grow out of the nation that become Canada that became Canada, I think, is something that we can be proud of. Are we perfect? Of course not. Are we trying to make things better as we move forward? Yes, we are. And that needs to be recognized. And that includes a better route up island. Well, yes. I yeah. can't help but think that as soon as we start... <laughs> no, here's the thing. I can't help but think that as soon as we start trying to pave a road anywhere, there's going to be protesters. Because well, that's just what we do now. People were opposed to the galloping goose when it was first proposed, but they use it every single day now. I use it every day. Wow, well, there we go. Galloping Goose Rail Line has been there 100 and how many years? I can't remember. As a bike as Oh, a bike I see. The, the paving it. Yeah. The paving the Galloping okay. Goose. Yeah, and I guess the ENN, paving the ENN. That's something that we've thought we about. Yeah. But, yeah. We, but here's the There's thing. There's the though. whole rail, it's federal indigenous rail, rights indigenous issue rights again. thing. Yeah. It's because the Sanana as people are currently in litigation yeah. with various levels of government saying that as soon as you don't use that for a train, it has to revert back to the traditional control. So, so cut a check, fix the tracks, run a little train up and down. <sighs> it's I, a risk, I no but idea. I think it could really pay off. Yeah, we've got, RCP's got jet boats. I mean, come I on. I know. Well, we've got money for RCP train. jet boats. Uh, <laughs> I just, yeah. I want to see these jet boats. Hi, hi, Gary. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Ralphie. Well, I'm sitting here uh, burning diesel, looking over Langford at all the brown boxes, brand new, going up. And I don't see cars going away anytime soon. People are moving here. They're moving fast. And here we are. We've got the biggest opportunity, and we'll never probably see it again because the NDP, if they don't get it right, they probably won't be back in for a long time. Not being that I'm, an, I'm not an NDP supporter, but for John, I sure hope he can pull this together and get us a proper road because the, the band-aids on the Malahat have just gone on and on and on, and there's, there's no end in sight there. It's just a bad road, and there's a beautiful piece of real estate over that hill that I'm looking at right here that, that'll, that'll provide a perfect highway, and there's the funny thing about all the oils they're worried about and stuff, but... Uh, you know, to be in that I do infrastructure, we have these great big tanks called oil separators, which are put right off the side of the road that collect all the gutter water. If there ever was an issue, they can pull up with a pumper truck, pull the lid off, and clean it up. Mm -hmm. So I just don't see why we're holding and studying, and we'll never, we'll never get that opportunity. If he doesn't do something for Vancouver Island, they're just going to pass us by because... There's too much stuff going over on in Vancouver. They want their bridges and they want their roads. We better get ours. I hope so, Gary. I would love to see to see if there was going to be a legacy of this NDP government to say that was the government decades from now. They'd say that was the government that finally said enough and fixed the transportation problems on the South Island. I think that would be an amazing legacy. And they were line. also the government that tried to fix the original transportation problems on, on the South Island. With the expressway. Yeah. The ex Except expansion the McKenzie, of Highway 1. Yeah, the McKenzie Interchange didn't get done. Well, that's the one piece on that it. they missed. But then the rest of the island, Highway 19, look at that thing. It's a freeway. Yeah. That's I, all NDP. I hope we see something. I really do. Because people, yeah, people feel like they get left behind. We look over at Vancouver. Oh, another giant bridge. Must be nice. Oh, another this, other that. We're like, hey, can we have something too? And we, there's too many times we've gotten left behind here. And the problem is, is that it's difficult enough to actually get anything built. But the government knows that anytime anybody tries to build anything here, there's going to be protests. There's going to be legal action. There's going to be just general obstructionism. Because it seems that that's half our economy these days. Half of our economy is trying to grow, trying to build things. And the other half is people building 
killing somebody while they try to oppose that. And mm. nothing happens. Everybody gets paid, so everybody has an incentive to keep the dysfunction going. And we're stuck. We're just spinning our wheels. I just, I don't know what to do about it. I look at... I look at what is happening, and I see a point potentially in the future where the country itself just stops working, where it breaks down, because too many people stand to benefit from standing in the way of progress. And I don't know what to do about that. Rick is on the air. Rick, go ahead. And I can't remember which person it was in the roundtable there that mentioned uh, we are the almost there. Um, that is, seems to be the mandate right now for the capital regional district mm -hmm. they really like to do everything kind of part way yeah. uh for example the mckenzie interchange um let's do half a cloverleaf well okay <laughs> but how long true. is that gonna last <laughs> <laughs> like, 20 years like come on right like you're doing it do it and it's Please. not just half it's it's actually a quarter of a qu of a of a clue. I uh, yeah, actually, I don't even yeah. No, you're you're right though, Rick. In terms of, the, I'm just happy that we finally got something right because we we were <laughs> we stuck something. with that horrible traffic light for so many years, and I just I I will I hope we never see it again. Yeah, me too. And it's going to help outbound traffic. Great, but again, with the Up Island Highway too. Um, the last caller mentioned, yeah, it should look like Highway 19 all the way up. Um, that is a, that is just a a dream when you're driving up there and you get past Parksville it's, it's free and clear thanks for the call Rick appreciate it all right we've got two minutes two and a half minutes left I think it's time for maybe some extended final thoughts on this uh, Mike Kozakowski thoughts I'll just say that uh, the 20% the of the population that lives in the city of Victoria is able to walk to work walk to uh, amenities etc sometimes loses touch with the reality of the other 80% and how dependent we are on the road infrastructure and how dependent we are on getting our goods and services delivered to the capital region via that road infrastructure. And when you look at all the time and the money that we waste sitting in traffic, when we really shouldn't be for such a small city, you start to recognize how much money is being dumped out of our pockets into, into what we, I guess, know collectively is just a congested society. And that's unfortunate. Right. I think we need to come back in a few months and revisit this conversation right here. Did we call it? I think, uh -huh. for one, we're going to see uh, the Niagara Main or some other other roads, like uh, Mike said, stitched together. And I think that's going to be the option. We're not going to see some big six-lane highway go through the watershed because that would be too much. We'll see that as a nice compromise solution. And maybe as a bonus, I wouldn't put money on it, but maybe something happens with the E&N. I mm. just want to restate that here. And I want to come back to it in a few months, and I want to see if we're right. But I, I kind, of, kind of want to put that out there. Yeah, Abbott, final I, thoughts? I agree with Ryan, and my thoughts are our population is growing. People need to get up island efficiently. How do we achieve transportation infrastructure that actually makes us better? Because we can't keep doing more of the same. I, I said this a few months ago, but I'll repeat myself here. It is embarrassing that we have one road that connects our entire island together, and the only alternative is 180 kilometers mm -hmm. out of the way. Um, China builds islands. They, they go out into the South China Sea and they move massive machines, undreamt of in their complexity and their sheer might by our ancestors, and they can build islands out of nothing in the middle of the ocean. And they're doing it right now. In a day and age where on this planet we have human beings able to construct islands in the middle of the ocean out of nothing, surely the people of Vancouver Island can get a road that functions over a hill that is only 400 meters high. And it is embarrassing that it has taken this long to get it done. I'm Adam Sterling. Stay with us. We're going to talk about this Balahat study. What might actually happen? BC Liberal MLA for Parksville Qualicum, Michelle Stilwell, will be joining us, giving us her thoughts coming up after the news. Stick around for that. We're also going to talk with a group who calls themselves Canadians for Affordable Energy. They have a bone to pick about the carbon tax. Everybody knows it's one of my favorite hobby horses to talk about, being a huge economics nerd myself. I'm interested to hear what they have to say and whether or not you agree with their position coming up. Stay with us. CFAX Victoria. An iHeart radio station. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. Good morning. I'm Kyle Reynolds with CFAX News to 10 o'clock. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau faced a lot of blunt questions from people at his town hall meeting stop in Regina last night. 
One man who works at a steel fabrication plant in the city told Trudeau the federal government should not have signed the new trade agreement with Washington because U.S. tariffs are hurting Canada's steel and aluminum in industries. Trudeau says there was too much at stake to walk away from the deal. And I know here that steel and aluminum is extraordinarily important, but so are our agricultural exports, so are uh, the billions of dollars worth of trade that every part of the country does with the United States, our most important market every single day. And that is something uh, that we needed to secure. Outside of the meeting at the University of Regina, some protesters held up signs with slogans such as Canada needs pipeline jobs. Saanich police are looking for witnesses to a dangerous driving incident near Lockside Elementary School. Police say an officer came upon a black 2017 Ford Fusion moving at a high rate of speed on Royal Oak Drive on Tuesday night. They say the driver was attempting to overtake another vehicle traveling at around 120 kilometers an hour in a 50 zone and crossing into incoming traffic, forcing the officer to take evasive action to avoid a collision. Police later caught up with the driver. He was then taken into custody and charged with dangerous driving. The Supreme Court of Canada says restrictions on voting rights for long-term expats was unconstitutional. In its ruling today, the country's top court says a restriction barring expats abroad for more than five years cannot be justified. The court says the idea of electoral fairness advanced by the government was vague. Two Canadians living in the United States for years maintained a 1993 law that barred them from voting, violated their charter right to vote. The Liberal government scrapped the ban last month, but the long-running case proceeded. Colin Perkle, the Canadian Press, Toronto. A uh, fired-up Jerry Diaz spoke at a rally of Ontario auto workers in Windsor this morning, just across from the, the river from the Detroit headquarters of General Motors. The uniform boss criticized GM's decision to shutter the assembly plant in Oshawa by the end of this year. Diaz warned GM management that next week's auto show in Detroit could be inundated by a flood of disgruntled workers. The protest comes as GM held a presentation to investors today in which it strengthened its pre-tax profit estimate for 2018 and predicted even better numbers in 2019. The CRTC and CBC are asking Ottawa to ensure that Netflix, YouTube and Amazon Prime pay their share of producing Canadian content. In written submissions to a government panel this week, both the broadcast regulator and the public broadcaster also called for new rules that encourage news content distributors to ensure they deliver accurate and trustworthy information. And the partial U.S. government shutdown is hitting home today for hundreds of thousands of U.S. federal workers. It's federal payday, but some 800,000 federal employees are not getting a check today. The shutdown's now 21 days old, and tomorrow will become the longest in American history. Pressure's growing to find an escape hatch amid the deadlock over funding President Trump's border wall. He's edging closer to declaring a national emergency, which would let him skirt Congress and build a wall unilaterally, though that would be certain to face legal challenges. Some lawmakers are worried it would mark extraordinary executive overreach. Sagar Magani, Washington. Taking a look at the markets now, the TSX is up today, 47 points. The Dow Jones is down 28 points, while the Nasdaq has lost 13 points. The Canadian dollar is down 8, one hundredths of a cent, and is now trading at 75.45 cents U.S. At CFAX News to 4 minutes past 10, a weather update is coming up. Here is today's CFAX 1070 News Poll. Do you think more can be done to stop illegal dumping in green spaces? Let us know what you think. Go to CFAX1070.com. CFAX weather now partly sunny into the afternoon today downtown with a high of 9 degrees. Showers possible tonight with an overnight low down to 7. Tomorrow partly cloudy with a chance of showers at a high of 8 degrees. Sunday looking primarily sunny with a high of 8. And Monday mostly sunny as well with a high of 7 degrees. I'm Kyle Reynolds. It's happening. It's here on CFAX 1070. It's 5 minutes past 10. Home to some of the world's most provocative thinkers and commentators. The Ted Radio Hour, Saturdays and Sundays on CFAX 1070. Now, Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. All right, it's been called a multimodal study. 
that is intended to help with transportation issues here on South Vancouver Island. Among the many potential things being explored would be an alternative to the Malahat. Well, that's something that many people who rely on the Malahat have been asking for for many, many years. Yes, there are concerns, specifically the watershed. There's also territorial issues. We know that we tend to live in an environment right now, politically speaking, where it is extremely difficult to actually build or change anything. We seem to be locked into place with various sides coalescing and opposing one another anytime any proposal is made to change or improve anything. Uh, the opposition is calling on the federal government to immediately consign what has been called the multimodal transportation plan to the dustbin instead of supporting the South Island's prosperity transportation plan. Because we already had a transportation plan. Government now coming up with a new one. I just, this whole thing is confusing. Wanted to bring our guest on the line. She's a member of the Legislative Assembly. One of the individuals, uh, her constituents, of course, rely on trying to get to and from the South Island and the mid and north parts of the island. Parksville Qualicum is her riding. Michelle Stilwell joining us today. Michelle Stilwell, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Adam. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty good. I was watching uh, CTV News the other night, and they had a, a photograph of Langford Mayor Stu Young, and he's got a, he had all of the studies that have been done on the Malahat Corridor sort of set out there, and it was this giant stack of boxes and binders and everything else. He's sort of rolling his eyes saying, one more study. Didn't we already do studies? What do you make of the announcement that has been made by the government? I think what we're seeing is just another typical NDP strategy of delaying and studying and avoiding actually making decisions. What's really uh, difficult for me to understand with this particular one that they've announced is there's already a plan in place with the South Island Prosperity Project. They've been working on it for years. They have the municipalities on board. They have um, businesses on board. They, they, they've done the work. And yet now the government is saying, no, 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 we need to do it again, spend more taxpayer dollars to make uh, more paperwork and more employment to, to create these studies and do the work when we need to get down to the business of actually making decisions that will affect and impact the people who live on Vancouver Island and improve the situation that they currently are experiencing. Now, in terms of the pre-existing plan, what did it prescribe for the Malahat? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there was a potential detour in there, was there? Um, I'm not particularly, I don't want to speak to the exact details of it because I'm not sure. But I, I know that the, the um, 11 out of the 13 capital regional district municipalities, local First Nations, like I said, the business community had already been working with the South Island prosperity project in in working to improving that transportation the transportation issues on the island and then you know for the minister to come out and say that um far too long infrastructure needs of the communities have been ignored referring to the former government the bc liberal government and that couldn't be further from the truth when 242 million dollars in transportation and infrastructure have been spent since just 2014 I mean, it was our government that um, moved forward on the McKenzie Interchange. It was true, our yeah. government that um, put $34 million into um, improving the, the five kilometers through Highway 1, through the Malahat. Um, you know, it was, it was our government that put $22 million into the West Shore Parkway extension. There, there was lots of work done by our government uh, throughout the years, but specifically $242 million just in 2014. And at some point, this government needs to start making decisions and in implementing them. You know, they're, they're re-studying the Massey Tunnel and, and trying to figure out a, a different avenue for that. We already had a project on the go. The money was spent. It was under budget, and, uh, expected under budget. And and it just got thrown in the trash. We have mounds of sand on the side of the highway out by the, the Massey Tunnel that's just sitting there, wasted. In the meantime, commuters are, are stuck in gridlock. Now, do you think, though, that there is that much harm in studying the issue? Because it's entirely possible that they will come to the same conclusions that were reached under your government and the projects or similar projects would go forward. Uh, if they're not doing anything, they can't break anything, for lack of a better term. So what's the harm in taking some time to study it? But I think, again, it's the work's already been done and the projects are already in place and the, the agreements and the partnership with Island Prosperity has already taken place. They're, they're already lined up and ready to go. Why would they um, put this in place to delay it? 
so that we can't move forward. And now commuters in Victoria will wait longer why do to you have think, a result. Why do you think they want to delay it? Because I think they're afraid of making decisions that are going to impact their ability to get elected if there's an election and when there's an election called. We have a very, very um, uncertain um, political situation in our province. We have a by-election going on in, in Nanaimo right now. And mm-hmm. if, if the Liberals win that seat, it can change the way government will move forward. We have a recall campaign on the Speaker of the House that... Uh, seems to be amping up. There's so much uncertainty, and I think they don't want to um, make overcommit themselves and make mistakes that will impact their ability to get elected. Do you think that's what this announcement about this transportation plan really was? It's uh, an election campaign, either for the by-election or a potential general election, following shortly thereafter. I think they nailed it. So, in terms of going forward, because you're, you're a person who has to drive back and forth across the Malahat from when the House is sitting to, to your constituency, many others as well, what should be happening with this particular patch of road? Because I think that's sort of the, the really substantive issue that has caught the attention of people here in the capital region. I know there's a million other projects in the province, but the Malahat seems to be the one that dominates the discussion here. So, what should be happening? I know, yes, your government spent a lot of money improving it. You had the, the dividers along the side of the road trying to reduce the number of head on collisions. I keep Mm -hmm. hearing, though, that we need some sort of alternative. Well, I certainly, I think safety comes first, and that's where we were investing the money when we were in government, because safety should come first. Absolutely. Now, the second thing is, we do we need an alternative route, and what is that route going to be, and what is the most feasible, what is the most logical? There's all sorts of ideas out there from people saying, pave the island corridor, the the rail corridor, and put an alternate route there, or going the the um, logging route and out and around. I mean, certainly we need to make sure that we have a plan in place that when accidents do happen on the Malahat, that we are clearing them in the most efficient possible way that we can. But the way to reduce those accidents is to focus on the safety, and that's what we did when we were in government. Um, but I'm not going to say it's an easy answer, mm-hmm. but sometimes somebody has to make a decision and move forward. And when you have a group like the Island Plus Prosperity, um, Southern Island Prosperity Project, who already did a lot of that work and has um, put money in for federal funding and, and having the PPP, we should not undo the work that's been done. If anything, the government should be helping support them to get the work done. Michelle Stilwell, BC Liberal MLA for Parksville Qualicum, defending the plan that was in place under the government of which she was a member. We're going to go to open lines on this and see what our listeners think. Any final thoughts you'd like to leave with us? Uh, I, I think, you know, just when it comes down to it, this government needs to start governing and stop playing games because um, it's not just about them staying in power. It's about the lives that are being impacted every single day by the decisions they're not making. Michelle Stowell, thank you for your time. Folks, what do you think of the case being made? Do you agree with that? Do you disagree? Why, why not? We'll take a quick break. Your call's after this. Hi, I'm Gail, and I've been volunteering at the Royal Museum Shop for 10 years. I love that I'm not only helping to support the museum, but also local artisans. It's a joy to say to our customers, it was made right here. We have gifts for every age, from books and toys to jewelry and original art. Visit the volunteers at the Royal Museum Shop. All proceeds support the Royal BC Museum. Or shop online and connect on social media. The Royal Museum Shop, intriguing and unique. Patterson Countertops, giving your kitchen the class it deserves while keeping it green. Offering eco-friendly alternatives and manufacturing with Green Guard certified water-based adhesives. Patterson Countertops. Learn more at pattersoncountertops.com. My name is Wally. I personally suffer from anxiety and depression. As a young boy myself, I was told that big boys don't cry. And I think that there is some sort of preconceived notion that boys can't suffer from mental illness because they're constantly told that they have to man up or they have to be tough and I think that we can all be allies in terms of creating a better environment for young boys to really express themselves. Mental health affects us all. Join the conversation on January 30th for Bell Let's Talk Day. A chip, crack, or break in your car's windshield? It happens. Maybe you parked too close to a ball diamond. Or if you're on a road trip and you see that little crack in your windshield get bigger and bigger, that's when you call Capital Glass. 
They take pride in pampering your car and accommodating your busy schedule. And all installations have a lifetime leak-free guarantee. Repairs, replacements, upgrades. Capital Glass does it all. Visit Capital Glass in Sydney and Victoria. If you're looking for a career, not just a job, with a company that cares about you, offers a flexible schedule and a competitive wage, Pacific Northwest Transportation would like to invite you to join their team of cruise industry professionals. They're looking for enthusiastic team members to fill driving and flagging positions. Experience is an asset, but paid training is available. To find out more and to apply to fill either of these positions, visit pnwts.com or call 1-844-504-1394. Become a valued team member at Pacific Northwest Transportation today. Uh, when you want today's best music, it's 107.3 Cool FM. Playing the most music all day. Gonna give you more. More hit music. Victoria's home for today's best music. 107.3 Cool FM. Connect with CTV News Vancouver Island. Connect on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And get full newscasts, plus exclusive extras at ctvnewsvancouverisland.ca. I'm Al Farabee. For CFAX Santis Anonymous, for 41 years, this great charity has encouraged thousands of children to smile in the face of life's challenges by supporting local families living with poverty through Christmas hampers, containing gifts for the children, and food for the holidays. And through the rest of the year, by raising funds for the needs of our community with special grants for schools, children's literacy programs, summer camps, and more. I encourage you to visit CFAXSantis.com to learn and find out more. It's time to get track-inspired performance with road-ready offers from Campus Acura. Right now, receive up to a $4,000 cash rebate on select 2019 Acura MDX models. Equipped to take on winter roads with standard super-handling all-wheel drive and Acura Watch driver safety and assistive technologies. Lease now from 1.9% for 36 months or get up to a $4,000 cash rebate on other select MDX models. Visit Campus Acura for details. 3347 Oak Street and online at campusacura.com. Stream CFAX 1070 from anywhere. Easy way to catch up on what's going on. On the new enhanced iHeartRadio app. Available on Android and iOS. You're listening to Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. I feel myself torn on this particular issue. On one hand, when they're studying, they can't break anything. No, 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 we don't want to break anything else. We don't want to make any more mistakes or accidentally trigger any constitutional crises. We just want things to work. At least I do. For a little while. BC Liberals, though, the opposition coming out saying, whoa, 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 we already had a South Island Prosperity Project. We had all these projects ready to go. Everything was approved. We had everybody on board. Now the NDP wants to redo that entire process. I will point out, though, that at least to my knowledge, there was no concrete plan for an alternative route to the Malahat in that particular document as it was. And if that gets added by redoing the study, then obviously that's a substantial difference that one could argue was worth our time to redo that process. However, if they end up coming to exactly the same findings as we're in the South Island Prosperity Project, yeah, I could see how we could argue that some time was wasted. Let's go to our phone lines. Uh, Peter, you're up first. Peter, what do you make of the case that was just made by the member of the opposition? Okay, several things i got, I got to say. is Okay, the uh, B.C. Liberals were in power for 15 years. Yeah, a little more, yes, actually, they, but yeah. Okay, whatever. Anyway, but the point is, yes, they put in some improvements, but they never did anything to put in a second route. And as we were, as everybody's talking before, we do need a second route, not only because of the traffic delays, if there's an accident and all that, and for economic, but remember, we're in an earthquake zone. That's and true. sooner yeah. or later, we're going to get hit. Mm-hmm. And my vision is that you're... The Malahat, all the, the uh, cliffs on the side, they're going to come onto the road. And they I, might, in yeah. my opinion, in my opinion, it's going to take three, maybe even four weeks to clear off the Malahat. Right? Well, and it's then, more longer, right? Because you, you have to think everywhere is going to be blocked. So there's only so many bulldozers they can get onto the island. The armed forces will end up being who shows up to save us when the big one happens. It'll be, yeah, it'll be months, if not years, before everything gets cleared. Okay, so right now we got all our eggs in one basket, the yeah. Malahat. Yeah. So that, that is absolutely wrong. But, they, but getting back to my original point is they had 15 years to fix it. Yeah, they did. And all they ever did was do minor improvements. So for them to come up or for that lady to come up and say, oh, well, we had this plan and we had that plan, 
great and dandy. You had a plan. Did you action the plan? Did you put any funds forward? What did you do? The answer is nothing. So that's where I stand on that. Peter, thanks for sharing your position with us. 250-386-1161, star 1070. Let's go next to Ron. Hey, Ron, good morning. Yes, good morning, Adam. You know, it's really rich for that liberal MLA to speak about the 16 months of NDP government and saying that they were delaying action when, in fact, very, very soon we're going to get, as I understand it, an action plan from them when... After 16 years of liberal government delay, you know, she was unable, when you asked her, for any concrete plan out of that so-called island prosperity initiative. Yeah, well, the reason I ask is I'm pretty sure, like, I am familiar with that plan, and I do not recall ever seeing a detour to the Malahat as being decided in it. I believe you're right. Yeah. But, you know, from 2001 to 2004, every single island seat was liberal. Right? That's true. Yeah, because it was there just Jenny no Green, to fail, right? Yeah. No NDP, no, nothing to obstruct them at all. And when you asked her, for instance, about her uh, you know, plan to do anything, she said, well, there are lots of ideas, quote, end quote. There are lots of ideas. She's aware of that. I mean, it's, it's hopeless, it, it, it seems. She says they were focused on safety. For 16 years, they were focused on safety, but not on an alternative route. So I, I think it was really an illumination of, of just how barren they are of anything but criticizing a new government that is obviously planning very soon to release a, 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 an action plan. Ron? Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Two five zero three eight six one one six one star ten seventy. I'm not hearing people being convinced on the lines, but hey, who knows? Maybe we will hear some. Let's go to Darren. Darren, you're up next. What do you make of the case made by the member of the opposition this morning? Oh, I don't know. <clears throat> if it's the member of the opposition. You know the problem that this province and country we live in. There's too many governing bodies and too many bodies of government to there's get a, a decision lot. done and, and yeah. to make me things move fast. Nothing moves fast anymore. You know, the McKenzie overpass should have been done before the one out of the airport because that's the infrastructure that was needed for the flow of traffic and the improvements of the highways. <clears throat> and what one point that I don't hear anybody making is the Malahat was never, ever meant to be a highway. It was uh, basically, you know, horse carriages and settlers and travelers in the 1800s that commuted to for Victoria and whatnot. Yeah, people used ships to get around way back in the day. It was from port to port is how you'd get around. Yeah, so it's it's still not meant to be a highway. The growth of this region is huge, and, yeah, it's needed. And, you know, what's behind there with the, the watershed and all that stuff, is it possible? Can it be done? It is possible, but with, with the way that our government structure is to get anything done fast, it, it hasn't happened, and it's probably... Not going to happen. It's not a surprise. You know, one of the things that I look at, Darren, is I look at economic development that happens elsewhere in the world. Here's a perfect example. Elon Musk, you know him. He's the, the leader of, uh, CEO, I should say, of Tesla, the electric car manufacturer. He tweeted the other day that they were breaking ground on a brand new plant that's going to pump out electric cars in, I believe it was in Shanghai, China. It might have been Shenzhen. Yeah. I have to check. Anyway, a city in China. Yeah. He says, we're going to have cars rolling off the line on this thing by June the 1st. And I went, oh my goodness. Like, like that seems like magic. Imagine shovels in the ground to finish product rolling off an assembly line in less than six months. That's what the rest of the world's doing right now. Meanwhile, we take 15 so like years. It's third world countries where there's not too many bodies of government because the yeah. government, you know, they steamroll. They do what they want. There's not, um, the, you know, too many body and governments and too many voices yeah. to get involved. To, to They don't allow that. They just push it through and they just do it. Yeah, and they're, and they're done. You know, six months from, from a shovel in the ground to a finished product. Here we take 15 years of public consultations. We go through four different plans. We have protests. We have all these other things. Nothing ever gets built. Nothing ever gets done. And we're getting yeah. left behind. And the rest of the world is laughing at us. I really do think they are because we don't yeah, get and, anything you know, done. That's why Stu Young's so frustrated. Another study, the study's already been done. And that's an example, I guess, of, again, the body and government that's come in or the, the, the whatever MLA it is that uh, has said, well, we got to do another study. No, we don't need it. Yes, we need it done. What are we going to do? Make a decision. No more studies. Just make a decision. Do it or don't. Mm. And don't forget, it was never, ever meant to be a highway. No. And I don't hear people mention that.
Darren, that's a good point. Thanks for calling into the show. Sure. Appreciate it. Two five zero three eight six one one six one star ten seventy. A free call on your wireless device. Sonny First now is also on yesterday with Al Faraby talking about this issue. I want to replay a couple of moments from that just to sort of get her her views on this because she acknowledges the need of an alternate route, but she also acknowledges that there are concerns about the watershed in that area. Soup Lake Reservoir is where you and I get most of our drinking water from. She also rose to prominence with concerns about a contaminated soil facility that was located uh, within a certain distance of both Shawnigan Lake and the potential Souk Lake River watershed. Now, my understanding is that there was never actually any, um, or at least there was never found to be any link in terms of any direct contamination involving the drinking water itself, but it was those concerns that were aired any number of times. So let's listen to a little bit of that just to get the alternate view on this matter. So we kind of have all three all three viewpoints from all the parties represented. Sonia, first now is a Green Party MLA for Cowichan Valley because, I mean, how many times have you taken the Malahat? Could you count? It's probably in the thousands, isn't it? No, it, I, I wouldn't want to count. Um, but when the house is in session, I actually stay down in Victoria because it wouldn't really be feasible with already sort of 14 to 16 hour days to add, you know, three hours of driving. Yeah, I hear you on that. But that's yeah. part of the the situation that people face, whether you're working long hours mm -hmm. or whether you're up on and you've got to come down for an appointment here in Victoria and something happens on the Malahats and people get stuck. So give me your thoughts because the BC government comes out and they say they're launching a feasibility study on an emergency route for the Malahat. Mm -hmm. um, is this just another study or is this just solid a solid start to something that is a solution finally? Yeah, I, well, there's, there's two parts of what they announced yesterday. One was the feasibility study for an alternative emergency route, which would be a route that would open only in the case of uh, the Malahat being shut down because of a serious accident, which, you know, we saw quite a few times last summer. So this would be uh, a way for people to be able to still move from the CVRD to the CRD or vice versa. The other part of the announcement is is what I actually find quite exciting, which is to look at developing uh, a proper long-term transportation study for southern Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. And this includes, you know, looking at a, a multimodal transportation study. So not just, you know, how do we get more highway lanes. This is about how do we move into a future where people on Vancouver Island have a, a, a wide array of ways to get around. Because right now it's pretty limited. If you don't have a car... It's pretty challenging to get out of the CRD and up to the rest of Vancouver Island. And so that's the part that I, I find uh, interesting and exciting because this conversation needs to happen and it needs to be a serious one and it needs to recognize that we don't want to uh, make 20th century solutions here. We really want 21st century solutions. And we want to look at, you know, how do we want transportation to look in 50 and 100 years from now? And this is part of... Um, looking into everything from cycling to transit to marine and ferry travel mm -hmm. and, and rail. that That's still on the table, mm -hmm. isn't it? Still on the table. There was a big meeting in December with uh, leaders of First Nations, mayors, uh, MLAs, transportation minister, premier, everybody at the table for several hours one afternoon to talk about the ENN corridor and what kind of uh, vision people had, and the, the vast majority of people at that table uh, were keen on seeing rail on, happening on that rail corridor. Now, you know that that that's a big long conversation, but I think again we want to be, if we are going to move in that direction, we want to build something not for last century, but for the next century. Which is all well and good. I just don't know what that means. Um, in terms of moving forward on this, that is the Green argument, the Green Party argument for why we need this new study. BC Liberals say, no, 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 we already did the study. We already had the plan in place. I, I, to my knowledge, there was no concrete decision in the previous plan to actually have an alternative route to the Malahat. So uh, do I support the idea for another study? I don't know. I just, I, I want things to work for a while. I'm kind of tired of living in perpetual constitutional crises. Um, we keep finding ourselves in them in terms of dysfunction. I just want things to work. And I think most people share that view. Most people out there are moderates. They want to do their best. They want to be respectful to all of the peoples of this country. They want to keep the earth clean 
and they want to help the environment where they can. But on the other hand, they got to get to work. They got to turn the lights on. And nothing is perfect. So if we wait until it's perfect, we never do anything, which, by the way, seems to be our new default setting in this nation is we just never do anything. We will take a quick break. I want to talk about the, fe- the uh, it's partially the federal carbon tax. We have our provincial carbon tax, which is what we all will be paying, what we have been paying since 2008. There's a group called Canadians for Affordable Energy. They are taking issue with this. They say the carbon tax is bad policy. Everybody knows I support a revenue neutral carbon tax, which we don't have in this province anymore more, by the way, but I'm interested in hearing their argument. That's next. Stay with us. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. Good morning, I'm Lisa Best with your CFAX 1070 News to 1031. The illegal dumping of furniture in a popular Saanich Park will cost a lot of cash and effort to clean up, and that money will have to come from the park budget. Two sofas, a chest of drawers, shelving, a dining room table and chairs, and even more were dumped in the park on Tuesday. Daryl Wick, a director with the Friends of Mount Doug Park Society, says the furniture was hauled off uh, off the trails, causing damage. We saw what looked like an entire house suite of furniture, and it, it wasn't by the by the road. It was hauled well into the park. And why they went to this ex- effort, I don't know. It, it's a quite an example of um, vandalism, as far as we're concerned. Wick says people need to realize the damage they do when they use the park as their garbage dump, including the disposal of the garden waste, is problematic because the soil gets in- contaminated. Mount Doug Park has the largest urban forest on the Saanich Peninsula. Canada's population of 37 million expected to swell over the next three years, but it won't be due to babies born. The federal government wants to add more than 1 million immigrants through 2021. That's nearly 1% of our country's population every year. Uh, Ahmad Hussein, the Federal Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, is himself an immigrant from Somalia. He says the influx will help offset the country's aging population and declining birth rate while growing, uh, growing the labor force. The federal government putting money into a new geothermal power facility in Saskatchewan. The first of its kind in Canada will be located in Estevan. The government providing $25.6 million in funding for the 5-megawatt facility, which will produce enough energy to power about 5,000 homes while taking the equivalent of yearly emission of 7,400 cars out of the atmosphere. 100 jobs will also be created during construction. And as the U.S. president edges closer to declaring a national emergency in order to fund his long-promised border wall, the House has voted to ensure all federal employees receive back pay after the shutdown ends. Washington is close to setting a dubious record for the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. More than 800,000 workers, most of them still on the job, missed their first paycheck today under the stoppage, which began on December 22nd. Miami International Airport is closing a terminal this weekend because they don't have screeners. The National Air Traffic Controllers Association is now suing the Trump administration. Your CFAX forecasts, mainly cloudy skies this afternoon, climbing to 11, partly cloudy tonight, dipping to low plus 5. Sunny tomorrow, 11, more sunshine on Sunday, 8, and the sunshine continues for back to work Monday with a high of 7 expected. For all of your DIY exterior product needs, visit ProTech Exterior Products. In person at 875 Ufield Road or at BeAHomePro.com. Right now in downtown Victoria, partly cloudy and 8. I'm Lisa Bastabit. Still happening. It's here on CFAX 1070. It's 1033. Fuel your mind on the drive home. Weekday afternoons with Mark Brené from 3 to 6. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. Now, Adam Sterling. On CFAX 1070. You know, I said before, solving the carbon dioxide issue for humanity in general is actually relatively easy. All you have to do is slap about 400, 500, 600 bucks a ton social cost on the carbon taxes, impose that tax. Large portions of the world would just shut down. You know, if you live in a part of the world that has a median income of about a dollar a day, you're not going to be able to afford paying several hundred dollars a ton on carbon dioxide for any machines that you use. That solution is never going to be implemented, though. You know why? Because it would be tremendously unfair to the poorer parts of the world and equality and how much people get hurt weighed against what benefit against reducing overall carbon dioxide emissions is what the debate that we have been having is actually about. Countries are making changes in terms of keeping inventories for the carbon dioxide emissions. Pop quiz, when was BC's top year for carbon dioxide emissions according to government numbers? It was actually 2000. 
2001. We emitted 68,415,000 tons, give or take. We're down from that. We are also down about 2.5% from the year 2007. That was when our carbon tax was originally introduced. The problem, though, is that there's disagreement and debate over whether or not that reduction in emissions was caused by the global recession, which hit everybody in 2008, or whether or not there really is a substantial reduction in emissions per unit of wealth or GDP created because of this carbon tax. We're the guinea pig that everybody's looking at in terms of the carbon tax because you and I have been paying one for the last 10 years. It hasn't been very big. It's been a small tax. Uh, my understanding from the academic literature out there is that there is a, an effect that is viewable, but it's very small. It's so small you have to use a sophisticated st uh, statistical analyses just to actually infer the effect that it's had. It's also true that our, that our emissions are still going up right now even though we are paying this carbon tax. The question, though, is whether or not they would be even higher without the tax. It's kind of like, remember, we used to talk about health care costs. Um, there was an argument over whether reducing the amount that we were planning to increase it by counted as a reduction or whether or not it was still technically an increase. These are why these conversations get so complicated. I want to welcome our guest onto the program to give an alternate perspective. He's uh, with a group that calls themselves Canadians for Affordable Energy. You've heard them in various newscasts. Interim President Kevin Lacey joining us today. Welcome to the program. How are you? Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me. So give us your organization's view on this. Because B.C., we paid a carbon tax since the year 2008. Uh, our, our emissions are down compared to 2007, but they are up compared to recent years. So they are climbing at the moment. What is your view of the carbon tax as a policy tool in general? Well, let me take on, first of all, those emission reductions that you mentioned, mentioned in the introduction. Yes. You know, those emission reductions actually happened in many other parts of the country that didn't have a carbon tax. That's very true. Uh, the maritime provinces, for example, have seen those similar types of declines in emissions, uh, yet has ne neither had the economy nor have they had the carbon tax that B.C. had. So when you talk about, you know, the carbon tax and its need, is it actually needed? And is it actually accomplishing the goal that it set out? And to me, I think that's the the central question uh, that we need to answer. Now, what our group did was we actually engaged in a very modest uh, attempt, uh, Adam, to try to look at just the cost of energy. So we looked at, you know, what are people paying and that it's a necessity of life. We see every year, uh, after, mostly after New Year's, there's a report about how much food has gone up every year. What we wanted to look at is how much is energy costing the average household in Canada and British Columbia. And what we found was that one of the single biggest impacts that will be felt this year and over the next few years will be by government policy. How much supply, energy supplies in the system, how much the costs are going to be, and, what the, and one of the biggest impacts is going to be the carbon tax. And it discriminates people based on where they live, based on uh, the type of heating that they use in their homes. All of these things mean that it's not everybody's not being impacted the same way. And it's calling for a real change in the way we look at the tax and its effectiveness. This is where we start to get into the thorny issues of economic equality and how much of a burden should be shared by whom. When you charge everybody exactly the same amount of money in carbon tax, here in British Columbia, where most of our power comes from hydroelectric power, from our dams, where we've actually had our emissions down since 2007, a carbon tax can be expected to harm our economy substantially less than, say, our friends and neighbors over in Alberta, where emissions continue to rise. Talk about that. Well, absolutely. So, you know, over a million homes in British Columbia um, use natural gas and heating. Those homes will be greater affected than those who are just using uh, electricity. So you know, between now and 2021, uh, natural gas costs, for example, will go up uh, by 31%. Now, natural gas, and just going to the, the effectiveness of the tax, natural gas is still substantially cheaper in British Columbia than electricity. So even though you're raising the cost, no one's going to, or most homeowners are not going to uh, make the switch from one to another uh, because the cost savings are still the same, which means it's just nothing but a tax grab. Uh, so, you know, this tax doesn't affect people the same way. Uh, and to your point about economic equality, yeah. if you look at around the world and globally, the countries that are the cleanest, that have some of the best environmental protections are not the poor countries, they're the rich ones. And if we're going to, if we really want to do something to uh, affect our environment in a positive way, what we should be looking at is giving our economy the power within it to protect our environment. Because we know that with 
um, strong resources, that it's with those resources that we can use to ensure that our environment is protected. I'll tell you one thing I, I wonder about in terms of carbon pricing and carbon taxation, in terms of new technology. You ask the average person out there, hey, when did coal use peak? You know, you know coal use, like shoveling into locomotives and whatnot through, yeah, right. through, through humanity. I'm mostly going to tell you, oh, 1880 or 1890, when, when there was these trains going back and forth. The actual answer is that it peaked about six and a half years ago in terms of planetary use. The issue is that as soon as we invented the internal combustion engine, we didn't need steam power anymore to move things around, we realized that we had all this extra coal lying around that we could use for other things, like heating homes, like running industrial boilers, like generating electricity. So we didn't leave the coal behind when we discovered the internal combustion engine for transportation. We used that coal for other things. Instead of having one form of energy for another, we had two, so we did twice as much. I wonder how we are supposed to make the same transition, though, this time without doing the same thing. Let's say we, we have all this new wind power and solar power and, and hydroelectric power, we've got our electric cars, and we have the battery problem solved, and everybody's got one, and they're cheap enough. Uh, we're not going to leave free energy sitting around doing nothing. We're going to put it to work unless there's some sort of government policy that discourages us from doing that. So what is the solution for reducing these emissions and having them not just keep going up forever without some sort of regulatory solution? Well, look, I think the, the, what we've seen as well, though, uh, Adam, at the same time, is that technologies have caught up. So in, in a lot of cases, we can now afford to have clean technology on things like scrubbers on our factories to help control our emissions. Um, but I think it's important, and I think the key point is to have energy that's affordable uh, for the average Canadian. I, you know, we cannot run our economy, and we cannot help our environment if we're taxed to death and we have no money to invest in the technologies we need to keep our environment clean. Uh, and the two do go hand in hand. You often hear people uh, come on programs and talk about how we need to discourage economic activity to do something for the environment. And this is where groups like ours significantly disagree because we see that the two are interconnected. And my concern is, and one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, speak out uh, about the issue is that we wanted to see uh, the clear linkage between economic growth and our environment. And you can see it right in, uh, in people's energy costs. Unless energy costs are affordable, that they, uh, that they have the resources they need, then their effect on our environment is not going to be as great. In terms of, of emissions intensity, i.e. the amount of wealth that we're generating with our emissions, we were talking a little bit about British Columbia, because we're the guinea pig, right? We're the test case, because we're one of the only jurisdictions that has had a carbon tax, at least in North America, for a substantial amount of time. It's a small tax, so any impact that we would that we would expect is small compared to... Because, you know, I guess the IPCC, the other government... Small, it's, always small, it's always small, though, if... if it's Depending small compared to what they it, right? want to do, right? Like they want yeah, hundreds right, or thousands right. of That's what I'm saying. Like it's it's small compared yeah. to what the scientists actually say it should be. So we shouldn't expect to halt our emissions or at least to substantially reduce them. We're holding the line at the moment. But one thing I have noticed, though, is that if you compare us to 2007, we have more than a half million new human beings in British Columbia that weren't here before. We went from 4.2 million to 4.8 million people. We also have increased our GDP by about 183 million or billion dollars a year to north of 220. So that's an extra 40 billion dollars of GDP, an extra 500,000 human beings that get up and start their cars every day, and yet our emissions are lower. So it seems like something's working. Do we really want to mess with that? No, and, and you know, as I mentioned on the top, I mean, there are other jurisdictions in Canada which are seeing the same types of emission reduction. Are there in terms uh, of yeah, GDP, sure. in terms of per capita, though? If you look at if you yep. look at the maritime provinces, in fact, they were reducing their emissions. Not a whole lot of GDP there, though. Yeah, but no, but if, yeah, but that's but my point. No, See, because here in BC, we're at, richer, and the Maritimes, they're not doing well, at right. least not lately. No, but they, the, 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 if, you look, if you look at um, the, the overall emissions, uh, and they were able to do it without having um, these carbon taxes in place, and it's not just about how much emissions, it's talking about um, the growth. So there's mm -hmm. not a direct correlation between, uh, between the two. I think the, the second point you look at is, and you mentioned it, which is how crazy is, are these taxes going to be? You, you talk about uh, many scientists are saying, and the United Nations is saying things like $500 uh, a ton of carbon tax, so that'll effectively render car use uh, obsolete. So, so there, we need to have a reasonable debate here about about what these taxes do and what they accomplish. And what I think the what if you look at the mm -hmm. facts of the matter, the facts of the matter show that it's difficult to see 
uh, what the impacts of these are, ex- these taxes are, except on the pocketbooks of average Canadians who are already struggling to make ends meet. It's tough because one of the easiest ways to reduce emissions is to engineer an economic recession. You know, that's, you know, the Maritimes, their, their emissions have gone down. Uh, their GDP is not doing nearly as well as ours has been. We got the number one economy in the country, at least at the moment, we have for, for quite some time. Uh, in terms of, of where we go next on this discussion, because one of the, one of the elements that at least the economic literature says is important for carbon taxation is the idea of revenue neutrality. It's not supposed to be a tax grab. The money that comes in is not supposed to be used by government for whatever. It's supposed to come back for people because that way you're not punishing folks that don't have a choice. Here in BC, we've done away with that. Now, the federal program is still giving rebates. What do you think of the, of the difference between those two? Well, I think, you know, I think revenue neutrality is one of these things which sounds great in academic literature and doesn't uh, work out necessarily in real life. And the reason is, is kind of something that our report points out, which is the tax affects every single person differently. Yes. Um, so, you know, there's no across the board um, uh, policy that will affect everyone the same, which means people's responses won't, won't be the same either. Yeah. So, for you know, like we mentioned natural gas, you're going to see a significant increase over the next uh, few years in natural gas costs. But will that actually change your behavior? And the answer is no. Same with driving. I mean, kids still need to get to hockey practice. Uh, they still need to get to school. Uh, all these things still need to happen. So are those co- are people going to really change their behavior? And what we've seen um, that unless the costs are so substantial that it's outrageous, uh, people's behavior will not change, which means the tax won't accomplish the goal that it wants. Here's what I don't understand, though, is that for your behavior not to change and for the costs of one of the things that you do, like driving a car to go up, it means that it's going to cost you more just to get by every year, right? So does everybody just have more money? Because I know lots of folks, they just don't have any more money. Their behavior has to change if the cost of something goes up. So how does that work? Well, it, 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 what it means is that they have to make decisions that, have, that affect their pocketbook in other ways. It, it doesn't necessarily affect um, their, their con- energy consumption. It could also affect other things on their budget. Uh, for example, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the shopping, uh, other things that, that, uh, that they need, food, mm-hmm. uh, the t- you know, all those things and necessities like, that, they can't, that they have. So once but you take money out But, but aren't, people, aren't emissions tied to all those things, too? Sure, and the rate so they're buying uh, less of those. So there's less emissions, is what I'm saying. Like, if for if, if they run out of money, their behavior is going to change. If their behavior changes, the emissions will change, won't it? Yeah, but the money just ends up in government coffers, which could spend somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, and that's that's really the that's really the choice um, you have. You can either uh, continue to put taxes in place like this. Money will continue to go to the government government will spend the money, or you can leave the money in your own pocketbook and choose how you spend it for yourself. Our guest is the interim president for the group, calls themselves Canadians for Affordable Energy, Kevin Lacey. Kevin, I want to say thank you for coming on, uh, expanding on your organization's point of view on this. Any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, look, I think this is an important debate. Uh, I think one that's important uh, for our environment, but we have to consider the cost. And when average Canadians are struggling to make ends meet, adding these extra carbon taxes in uh, is having a big impact on the pocketbook. And uh, Canadians are struggling, and it's time to, uh, uh, to do something that's important for environment, like growing our economy rather than taxing it. Kevin Lacey, thank you for your time. All the best. Thanks, Adam. Take care. That's Kevin Lacey, interim president of the group Canadians for Affordable Energy. That's a viewpoint that I hear out there, and I hear it quite commonly. Do you share it? What do you think? 250-386-1161. And the global recession, by the way, very unfortunate for any number of reasons. Certainly one of them is that it's really tough to tell what our carbon tax did. Because we got hit with the global credit meltdown just as our carbon tax was starting to take effect. So emissions took a nosedive. They took a nosedive everywhere. That is absolutely true. They have been coming back up in recent years. It's difficult to remove that sort of crater, for lack of a better word, in our GDP readings and in our emissions readings to try to see what this little tax actually did. Did it work? Did it not work? Depends on how big of an effect you want it. I'll tell you one thing, though. Uh, you're not going to get to your Paris targets with carbon pricing where it is set. And if we wanted to get to our Paris targets with carbon pricing where it is set, there would be a lot of folks hurting. Absolutely, there would be a lot of folks hurting. Your calls after this.
You made iHeartRadio the number one streaming app in Canada. iHeartRadio app. Welcome to iHeartRadio. Over 1,000 radio stations, hundreds of commercial free playlists, over 10,000 podcast titles, and coming soon, your ability to create custom stations on the fly. If you still haven't done so, download your free iHeartRadio app. Music and radio in one free app, iHeartRadio. And start streaming on all your favorite devices and platforms. And thank you for making iHeartRadio the biggest radio streaming app in Canada. Don't miss the Campus Acura Clear Out with huge savings for January. Everything must go. Join them today at 3347 Oak Street. Seniors 55 and over can now enjoy 20% off any size Mid-Cafe Premium Roast Coffee. Enjoy our delicious signature blend made from 100% Arabica beans. Plus, buy any seven hot beverages and get the eighth medium free at participating restaurants in Western Canada. Todd Talbot here for VGH Millionaire Lottery, reminding you that time is running out for you to become a multi-millionaire. What will your new millionaire lifestyle look like? Choose from eight grand prizes, including 2.7 million cash. At 74% sold, it's your best opportunity to win. Somebody's going to win millions. It should be you. Start the new year as a multi-millionaire. Hurry, final deadline, January 11th. Tickets at London Drugs or MillionaireLottery.com. 19 plus to play. Know your limit. Play within it. It's the slowest time of the year. Clean up with Coit Cleaning Services. Right now, save 40% off all services. Coit's team of professionally trained technicians will clean your air ducts, carpets, upholstery, tile and stone, wood floors, area rugs, drapes, and lines. Kelly called Coit to clean her carpet and upholstery. Look at this. Spots upon spots from grandkids, dogs, cats. They need to be cleaned. How did Coit do? My carpet looks beautiful. It looks brand new. Save 40% off all cleaning services. Call 1-800-4-COIT. That's F-O-R-C-O-I-T. Here on the West Coast, we don't get a little rain. We don't get a bit of rain. We get a lot of rain. How confident are you that your RV's seams and seals are ready for the rest of winter? When you take your RV to Tom's RV, their top-of-the-line seal tech machine detects cracks in your caulking, so you don't end up with any surprises come spring. Do it now, do it better. At Tom's RV Service and Supplies, Moff Jacklin in Lankford. This is Tom Williams, owner of Aerial Roofing. We're into the wet and cold season now. How's your roof holding up? If you're not sure, we'll come by and assess your roof for you. And if it's fine, we'll let you know. Get some peace of mind regarding your home and know exactly what's above your head. And if you do need a new roof, well, it often costs less than you might think. We're Aerial Roofing, and we're honest about roofing. For a free estimate, get in touch at aerialroofing.ca. CTV News at 6 with Andrew Johnson. Weeknights on CTV Vancouver Island. The right song at the right time. It's like lightning in a bottle. CTV's The Launch is back. With industry legends, Ryan Adams, Niall Rogers, Ryan Setter, and Sarah McLaughlin. When I'm in the studio creating music, it's a magical thing. Jan Arden, Max Kerman, and Bibi Rexa. When I'm writing with other writers in the studio, it's a high that you cannot explain. Get into the search for Canada's next big hit. A new season of The Launch. Streaming Wednesday, January 30th on CTV. Keeping you informed, Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. Is BC's carbon tax working? Well, it depends on what you mean by working. Is it getting us to our, our Paris targets? Oh, no, 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 not not, uh, not even close. Um, are our emissions lower than they were before the tax was brought in? Yeah, that's true. And that's also true, even though we have 500,000 extra people. And that's true, even though we have an extra $40 billion adjusted for inflation of GDP since we made that change in the year 2008. Problem is, is that the world economy got hit by the credit meltdown in 2008. So everybody's economy slowed down. So all of the emissions slowed down as well. Everybody went, wow, this is great for the environment. Problem, though, is that making people poor is a solution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but I don't think it's one where people actually want to live in those conditions. The idea is to encourage cleaner technologies, innovation, and new options to emerge within the market. Now, a carbon tax, economists tell us, is the cheapest way to do that. There are other ways to reduce your emissions. The argument is that the carbon tax is the least cost way. Whatever that cost is going to be, if you want to have the same effect, it'll actually be more painful if you try to do it with regulation. And, and I can see the argument, though. The argument that equality and economic inequality 
needs to be an element of this conversation, I think is very important. We have the Mouvement des Gilets Jaunes in France, where people just were tired of taxation. They were tired of what they saw as the elites in France just continually dumping more costs on people. So they, there was a, a rebellion, for lack of a better word, that broke out there. And I don't know where that's actually going to end. I have a text here on 107010, which is a very uh, good point. It says, what's the cost of climate change to families versus the carbon tax? Um, I don't actually know how to put a number on that. I know it's one of the things the city of Victoria is trying to figure out right now, is how much does climate change actually cost us? How much does it cost to have the windstorm like we had that blew us off the map on December the 20th? How much does it cost to have all this weirdness happening with sea levels going up and whatnot? And by the way, sea levels are rising. They've gone up, uh, I think it's a few inches in the last 50 to 100 years, and they're expected to go up more. How big of an issue will that be? Well, it's tough to put a price tag on that. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind, I'll get to calls in just a moment, is that Canada, well, our, the latest numbers I have are 2016. We made 704 million tons of CO2 across this great land of ours, blasted it up into the atmosphere. The United States has reduced their emissions by that much in the last 10 years. The United States has cleared out an entire Canada worth of planet Earth's carbon dioxide space in the last 10 years. And China, meanwhile, has increased their output by more than 2 billion tons a year. That's about three Canada's worth. Just, just over the last 10 years while we had our carbon tax. Can we make a difference? Not by ourselves. We can be part of collective action. That signaling, that social license is what they call it, which hasn't gone well, by the way. That's the real value in doing this, is to do this to induce other bigger nations that do make all the difference to do it. Will that happen? Time will tell. I want to go to, let's see, it's going to be, uh, I think it's Dan. Dan, you're on the air. What do you make of the argument we heard? Well, I'm just looking at how well the Paris Accord's working in Paris. Ah, shit. things aren't things aren't great in Paris, are they? It's uh, yeah, it's it, an unfortunately it's named beautiful. thing. Yeah, right, but <sighs> like, uh, peop, is, uh, any house you go to look at now is on electric heat. Yep. It's like, are you kidding me? Like, uh, electric heat should be cheap. They, they should be cheap. But I'm on natural gas. It's cheaper than ele- uh, than electrical. Not for long. I, I, no, I think uh, they're going to change that. Yeah. Well, well, you know what? There's going to be a revolution like they, they're having in France right now because that is just. The, this carbon tax stuff is just utter gobbledygook. <laughs> it's... We, we, we have to get the nations that are burning coal, right? Now, that's why we need to get our natural gas to China yep. to yes, stop them from burning coal. Yep. Yep. I mean, you got to start thinking with your – stop thinking with your hearts, people, and think with your minds. Yeah. It's, it's I tough. mean, this carbon tax is just going to hurt me, mm. right? Yeah. Like I, I conserve and I conserve and I conserve and I recycle, and now it's just it's just gonna nut me before I retire. <sighs> I, I don't know what to do about this issue because if you look at what the scientists are telling us, the planet needs to reduce by it's gonna hurt and it's gonna hurt a lot of people. And sure, the carbon tax costs, uh, but if if you we want to do it another way, it might hurt us even more. I don't know what to do. I honestly don't. Well, we're we're, we're coming up with new technologies, but they're fifty years out. Yeah. Right, right, new, cleaner technologies. I mean, we should actually have a couple more dams. If we want to go to electricity, which is the cleanest, hydroelectricity is the cleanest power we can get. Yeah, we got to be building it right now. And yeah, we don't we build anything. Do now, yeah. and, you know, let, let, let's have some vision. Yeah. I appreciate the call, Dan. Thank you. 250-386-1161. I want to go to Owen. Owen, what do you make of this issue? I think it's a non-issue. Yeah. A yeah, non-issue? Oh, yeah. I tell you something. If you just drive around, you can see everyone's driving nothing but these trucks now. Like Ford doesn't even make a sedan anymore; they're making these RVs. I see. I see. They're making little electric stuff too, aren't they? Well, yeah, they're starting. They're starting because everybody is. Everybody's got an electric car now. It's just the new thing. Anyway, we're talking about today, right now. You go out on the highway; it's nothing but trucks. Mm -hmm. All these young guys, they buy trucks. You know, you you look at the uh, Collard Crawl there. Is nothing but trucks. You know, there's absolutely no thought of, uh, you know, fuel. You know, you know, the economy is good right now. People can afford these vehicles. So I don't, I don't buy this stuff about how, you know, oh, this tax is going to bankrupt us and make us poor. You know, how, how much, what, how much money are they talking about here? Well, ours is 35 bucks a ton right now. It's going to go up by five bucks a year until 2021. So we're going to be sitting there about 50 bucks a ton. They say that's okay. Yeah. Look, if you can afford 50 grand for a brand new Ford 350 or whatever it is they buy these days, you can afford some extra money for some uh, 
you know, on this carbon tax thing. And, you know, I tell you something since I'm on it here. Like, the city itself doesn't take this stuff seriously. They they never walk the walk. Like, I'll give you an example. What's that? You know, okay, for example, this uh, this Uber thing. Yeah. You know, now the, all the cab companies in Victoria, they're all electric or hybrid. Mm-hmm. And Lisa Helps is saying, oh, we, we welcome Uber. It's another transportation. But these Uber guys don't go out and buy expensive hybrids and electric cars. Oh, no, what? they'll pick you up and... Any old, they'll pick you up in a Hummer. Hmm, I didn't thought of that. No thought whatsoever to uh, saving to carbon, right? Interesting. I didn't thought of that. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's just so hypocritical. It, it just blows my mind, you know? So, if they want to, you know, if they want to uh, save a lot of carbon and, you know, reduce congestion downtown, they make it easy to take a cab. The know? easiest way to reduce our emissions is to get really poor really fast. Nobody wants to do that. So, we'll keep looking for another solution. Owen, thanks for the call. Appreciate it. All right, folks, we'll wrap up for now. Quick break. Up next, Professor Ron Cheffins takes a look for the week at the world of Canadian politics. CFAX Victoria. An iHeart radio station. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. Good morning. It's 11 o'clock. I'm James Gardner with CFAX 1070 News. The nonprofit group Canadians for Affordable Energy has released a report showing how BC's carbon tax will impact the cost of living for families in this province. BC residents currently paying a carbon tax of $35 a ton, and that's slated to increase by $5 a ton every year until 2021. Group President Kevin Lacey says natural gas is the largest single source of energy used in the province, and the carbon tax will hike the price. The BC carbon tax discriminates, and it'll affect some homeowners greater than others. And it, it, over the next few years, by 2021, natural gas prices will increase by 31%, largely as a result of the carbon tax. It's about uh, $268 a household. And Lacey says the tax will also increase the price of gasoline by 8% in the province that all already has some of the country's highest prices. Well, the city of Victoria is creating a rentals, uh, renters rather, advisory committee. The city's looking for 12 people who either rent or have experience in the rental industry. They will be the voice of the roughly 60% of Victorians who rent. Emily Rogers, legal advocate for Together Against Poverty Society, says this is good news as the rental crisis is causing a lot of issues. We have families camping at Goldstream. We have UVic students living in their car. We have seniors who have been in their units for decades living modestly told that their rent is going to double uh, because of renovations that are happening. So these are the kind of stories we hear day in and day out, and it's really impacting our city. She she says the business sector feels the effect because it's a challenge finding work or staying employed when you don't have a place to live. The deadline to join the committee is next Thursday. Despite it not being a dump, a lot of trash gets tossed into Mount Doug Park. Andrew Berger with Sandwich Park says they got a report Tuesday morning of a large-scale dumping there. Basically, the contents of a one-bedroom apartment tucked behind our fences, so they go through the trouble of going into the parking lot and actually carrying it into the park, like a good 50 feet into the park. So our staff responded and actually had it cleaned out by the end of day yesterday. So couches, chairs, tables, cabinets, you name it. He says trash dumping has been increasing over the past years, with staff having to deal with garbage in their parks daily. Berger adds that people are also taking plants, especially anything edible like mushrooms. He says taxpayers have to pay for cleanup efforts and he wants illegal dumping stopped. The country's highest court has ruled a law that stripped Canadians who lived abroad for more than five years of their voting rights was unconstitutional. The country's top court has determined the law already overturned by the Trudeau government wasn't justified. A pair of Canadians living in the U.S. filed suit, claiming the now-defunct law violated their charter rights. U.S. lawmakers are moving to approve a law that would give $800,000 U.S. to federal workers, or 800,000 U.S. federal workers, their back pay, 
when the country's partial government shutdown ends. More from Andy Field. Speaker Nancy Pelosi on the House floor describing how many federal employees are coping. Taking to the internet to sell some of their household items. Democratic leader Steny Hoyer saying his party will give the president most of the border security he wants, but not what he calls an ineffective wall. No one should have to go without a paycheck just because the president thinks he can bully Congress. Republicans likely to join Democrats in approving back pay for federal workers. Andy Field, ABC News, Washington. I'm now to take a look at your money markets. The Canadian dollar is down in trading this hour. It's trading at 75.59 cents U.S., just a bit, though. And NASDAQ down 32 points. Meantime, Dow Jones is down as well, 94 points. And the TSX is up 40 points. Here is today's CFAX 1070 News Poll. Do you think more can be done to stop illegal dumping in green spaces? Let us know what you think. Go to CFAX1070.com. <laughs> CFAX 1070 weather brought to you by Borden Mercantile. Cloudy today, but at least no rain in the forecast as yet. Mainly cloudy, a high of 11 degrees. And then for tonight, a few clouds, a low of 5. Tomorrow, sunshine and a high of 11. Much the same for Sunday. A little cooler, though, with a high of 8. And sunshine right through to Monday. Monday's high near 7. Right now in Victoria, it's mostly cloudy. It's currently 8 degrees. Save $5 off 15 pounds of Nutrim Cat or Dog Food at Borden Mercantile. Ask about the frequent fire program. Borden Mercantile, on Borden Street near Quadra and McKenzie. I'm James Gardner. If it's happening, it's here on CFAX 1070. It's 1106. Home to some of the world's most provocative thinkers and commentators. The TED Radio Hour, Saturdays and Sundays on CFAX 1070. Now, Adam Sterling. On CFAX 1070. All right, it is time now for his regular segment, one of Canada's foremost constitutional and political experts, Professor Emeritus of Law and Political Science at the University of Victoria, Professor Ron Cheffins. Good morning, sir. Pleasure as always. Yes, here we are. I might note to you on Tuesday night, I said we would do the regular programming, but I would delay it slightly if federal by-elections were called. Yes. They've been called in three ridings. So let's dive in. In Burnaby, South, and of course York, Simcoe, and in Outremont. And so we'll watch those with great interest, and I will comment on those in considerable detail. But the election is to be held on February the 25th. What's interesting, Adam, is under the Federal Elections Act... There must be at least 36 days before a by-election or a general election. Yes. This was 47 days. Interesting. So the Liberals have delayed it as long as possible. And if you read Andrew Coyne, what they really want, they want Mr. Singh to win because they don't want the NDP to gather strength. But on the other hand, if Mr. Singh doesn't win... It makes it very, very difficult in this short time frame to replace them as leader. Yes. See what I'm saying? I do. Because, as Andrew Coyne put it, they'd still like to win it as long as they can be sure Mr. Sting stays on as leader. Hence, the exquisite timing of the election, neither so early as to permit Singh to be easily disposed of, nor too late as to seem to be obvious. Aren't the Liberals clever? Well, it's interesting. The former leader of the NDP, Mr. Tom Mulcair, who is uh, now a political commentator for CTV, told CTV's Don Martin earlier this week that if Mr. Singh loses this by-election, that he should indeed step down from the leadership. And I believe that Mr. Singh has indicated that win or lose, he intends to lead the New Democrats into the next election. So for the previous leader to publicly make a declaration like that, that hurts. You've read my mind. That's the next point I was going to make. Oh. I heard that interview. It was, wasn't was that extraordinary? I thought, well, let me just comment on this. Yes, please. Mr. Mulcair, to my absolute shock, attacked Premier Notley of Alberta, a fellow NDPer, and disagreed with her policies and predicted she would lose the election. Now, that's fine for you and I or Mr. Iveson or... Uh, commentators to predict that, but for a former leader of the NDP to predict his own premier's demise 
quite shocking. And then I heard that thing. He said, if Mr. Singh loses, he's out. Yeah. Two, two explanations, uh, Adam. Mm -hmm. One, he's very bitter about being deposed as leader. Mm. Or he's trying to prove his credentials as an independent analyst. What do you think? I, I think it, it might be a mixture of the two. I know that uh, it was when he called that leadership review, and I remember the conversations that we had around that time, uh, I think he was clearly shocked that, I believe it was 47% or something along that, those lines of New Democrats voted to essentially keep him on, and that was the end of him once he had gone through that sort of public shaming, for lack of a better word, with the leadership review. And you have to think that there's going to be some bad blood there is some resentment there. But on the other hand, to be an effective political commentator, one must be able to openly criticize every right. party, regardless of previous affiliations. And we've all been through that one way or the other. And you remember he lost in Edmonton. Oh, it, yes. It wasn't a vote of the whole party. It was on the floor voting in the, in the city of Edmonton. Yes. So I think there's a lingering antagonism. Ah, Remember that. I hadn't th you're right I hadn't I hadn't thought of the yeah. provincial connection I had forgotten which city that was in Absolutely it okay. was Edmonton and m many people felt that if that meeting had been held in say Montreal or Toronto he would have survived Fascinating but because so let's keep that in mind but in any event I was going to mention that intervention by Mr Mulcair and there have been suggestions if Singh does lose the NDP could have uh, a brief leadership uh, change, but I'm still skeptical of that. I'm still betting that Singh is going to win, but we'll just have to wait and see. And let me say, Adam, yes. we've, got, we've got six or seven weeks to go. I'll do a detailed analysis of each of these writings as we go along. Okay. Because, as I said, I taught at the University of Montreal for one year, which was right in the heart of the Outremont writing. So I know that writing very well. So we'll put that on hold for now, okay? All right. Okay, let's turn to what we're going to do. But this just should be very... By the way, hmm? what about our little friends in Nanaimo? Let's remember what I said on last week's show. You cannot call an election nine months before a general election under the new change in the law. Yes. So what happens? Mr. Trudeau has until January the 20th to call a by-election in Nanaimo. Interesting, because I because there will need to be one called. Yes, it can't well, be left open, or can it? But I think it'll. I have a feeling he won't call it. Okay, that's my instinct. Though the Conservatives have already nominated someone called Mr. John Hurst yes. to run in that running, but I think there's a good chance he may let it go. And then, you remember that Mr. Diorio from Saint Leonard, he sent a letter about two months ago that he's running, uh, uh, resigning on January 22nd. So that writing will stay open. Interesting. It can't be called after January the 21st. Hmm. Uh, my guess is that they might leave that Nanaimo thing open till the general election, but we'll wait and see. Yes. Okay? Well, what we're going to do now, last week we did a quick rundown of Premier's approval ratings, mm -hmm. and I'm going to look at each province in detail as I look at the Premier approval. But there's some interesting things ahead, and I'm just going to give you a little... A forerunner. See if you follow this, Adam. Okay. When we get to BC, which is number three, Mr. Horgan, have you followed that there's a, a an attempt to have a recall of Mr. Plekas in Abbotsford South? I had the opportunity to speak with the individual organizing oh. that campaign earlier this week. Oh, I'm excited. Tell me about that. Fascinating. It seems that their primary motivations is more about changing the government by triggering a, a general election subsequent to a successful recall than about recalling uh, Speaker Plekas himself, although Abbotsford South has been a solidly BC Liberal conservative leaning riding for, for no, no small amount of time. It's, it's fascinating to sort of hear how this is shaping up. As, as, as you and I have remarked upon in the past, the NDP recently actually strengthened recall legislation. I believe it was in November they forced it through, banning corporate and union donations. Among That's other. correct. So the recall, there's been, what, 26 recalls uh, since the legislation was introduced in the 90s. There's only been one that was almost successful. That was that Parksville, was Qualicum with Paul, Paul Rietzma. Rietzma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but nobody's ever made it work, and it's harder than ever to do. So I can't help but wonder how, how good his chances really are. Well, the rule is you have to have 40 percent of the registered voters sign a petition for recall 40 percent there were 41,000 registered voters 
So they get they have to get 40% of that. I forgot, I have the number here. Yeah, somewhere. It's an enormous it, number of signatures. 16,400. Hmm. That's a big job. Well, it's like the turnover for a general election, except it's going to be a public declaration of one's political position on a public document. It's extraordinary what they need to do. But Plekis is so unpopular, they've got 300 volunteers, they might pull this off. Well, we'll watch this with great interest. Oh, we will. We will. Okay. Well, let's look at the, and we'll probably only get through two or three premiers today, but this is lots of fun. Number one on the approval list with 59% is Mr. Legault, mm -hmm. the premier of Quebec and head of the, uh, the CAC, Coalition Avenir de Quebec. Mm -hmm. Now, what was most interesting about that election, when he got election, was the, the Liberals got 28 seats. That was the lowest number of seats the Liberal Party has ever received since Confederation in a provincial election. Hmm. And what was particularly interesting is 26 of those seats were either in Laval, which is an, uh, an island just north of Montreal, Montreal, or just across the river in St. Lambert and Chambly. It's become or had become a party largely driven by Anglophones and Allophones. In case people don't know what I mean by an Allophone, someone whose first language is not English or French. Okay. And I hadn't seen this in the press, but I got a call from Ottawa that Mr. Cuillard's seat, which is one of the two that were not in the Montreal area, was won by the CAC. There was nothing in the newspapers about that. I was not aware of that either. Neither was I. I said, I hadn't read this, but this friend of mine who's in the consulting business thought I should know that. Hmm. So that's very interesting. And what I also read in one liner was that among Francophone voters, the provincial liberals only got 12% of the vote. Really? Yeah. So they, 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 they become a Montreal-based, largely Anglophone, Allophone party. Hmm. And um, and you had in Mr. Cuillard probably the most generous-spirited, tolerant, leaf nationalist premier in Quebec history. I guess that's why he only got 12%. I was going to say, I think we know what the people want, and it's not that. Uh, let's take our first break okay, here. All right. You. Professor Rod Sheffens continues his analysis in just a moment. Stay with us. The Whole Home Show with Tony Joe. Everyone wants to know about real estate. Is the market going up or down? Time to buy or sell? How can government programs and policies affect you? Hear from local experts on topics like appraisal, inspection, investment, and others on how to maximize your real estate sale. Providing info on everything you ever needed to know about real estate. The Whole Home Show with Tony Joe. Saturdays at noon on CFAX 1070. We're on a collision course with a pulsar. Tonight. Ah, oh, what a relief. Thought we were all going to die. The wait is over. Welcome to Discovery. Star Trek Discovery returns to space. I look forward to it. Hidden. It's an all-new season of adventure with some familiar old friends joining the crew. Captain Christopher Pike requests permission to come aboard. I'm here to take command of the Discovery. Spock, is that a smile I see on your face? Yes. Star Trek Discovery season premiere tonight at 5 on Space. Dust off your cowboy boots and put on your 10-gallon hat. Tonight is country night at the Victoria Royals game. Presented by Remax. Mosey on down to the barn on Blanchard for a showdown against the Kamloops Blazers. The first 2,000 fans receive bandanas. Yahoo! Then tomorrow night, the Royals battle the Silver Tips. Get your tickets at victoriaroyals.com and come <laughs> with us. Hi, everybody. It's me, Dave, from BC Hydro. Now, here's one for all you business owners out there. How many light bulbs does it take to change your bottom line? No, seriously. The money you could save with an energy efficiency upgrade is no joke. Whether it's your HVAC, lighting, refrigeration, or more, we'll give you funding to get started, potentially saving you over $3,000 a year. Boost your power smarts and save at bchydro.com slash business incentives. Hmm, feeder bar, brush roll, electrostatic filter bag, 
What does all of this stuff mean? Why does picking a vacuum have to be so tough? Good news. It doesn't have to be. Hi, it's Wendy for All Victoria Vacuums. We stock and repair all the best vacuums. Our large selection includes every Miele, Dyson, and Beam, just to mention a few. And our expert staff take the hassle out of buying a vacuum. Visit us at Hillside and Cedar Hill for the latest Miele deals or check us out online, allvictoriavacuums.com. CTV News at 5 and 11 with Joe Perkins for local news, lifestyle, and entertainment. Weeknights on CTV Vancouver Island, online at ctvnewsvancouverisland.ca. Hey, I'm Al Farabee. You know, we all take pride in our local thrifty food, so let's talk to some of the folks inside the James Bay store. Your name is? Nadine. And you've been here at James Bay Thrifty Foods for how long? Six years. What are some of the cool things about working here that you really like? I really enjoy my co-workers. Everybody's so loving. It's like a family here. I even got my daughter working here now, too. So <laughs> I got my family family and my work family. <laughs> Your name is? Linda. Linda. And you are? Um, all right. And you guys are free. You're from out of town. Yes. But, but you're here because why? Because it's awesome here. They're very friendly here. Uh, they And they always treat us like we're, we're home. Is there anything you don't like here? <laughs> I can't think of anything I don't like here. The, the carrot cake really looks yummy. I'm Linda. I'm Tom. And James Bay is my thrifty food. There you have it. Whether you're a staff member or a customer, we all share a piece in our favorite island grocery store. I'm Al Thorby at the James Bay store. Listen for me at your local thrifty foods. Listen to CFAX 1070. Download iHeartRadio today and take us with you wherever you go. On iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio.ca. This is Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. Back on the air now, continuing our conversation with Professor Ron Cheffins. Professor, going through Premier's approval ratings, starting with Quebec. Yes, 59%. And Mr. Legault, I think, tapped into what is called nationalism. Now, so we don't just throw words around. Let me explain what I mean. Please. In Quebec, it means maximum autonomy from Ottawa without separation. All right. And number two, maximum protection and advancement of the French language. And I think Mr. Legault, who'd been a former cabinet minister in a sovereignist PQ government, tapped into that feeling. The feeling was he was going to protect Quebec's interests, not be run by Ottawa or the Anglophones of Montreal, and he tapped into that mood. And it's very interesting. How did he do this? First of all, he promised to reduce immigration of economic migrants. Now, what happens in Quebec, Adam, is refugees, etc., and family reunification is under Ottawa. But if you're applying as immigrant in the basis of your capacity to get a job, an economic immigrant, that is handed to Quebec. I see. So he, re he has reduced that immigration by 10% from 50,000 down to 40,000, and it taps into nationalism because what happens in Quebec is immigrants come from around the world, but they quickly move into the English-speaking world mm -hmm. because English is such a positive language. So this is part of the idea that we're not going to be swamped by immigrants who become anglicized. Can I put it that way? I can see that. All right. That's a, that's a nationalist move. Even though there are many jobs in Quebec, then the other nationalist move was getting rid of religious symbols in the workplace that feeds into the quebec nationalists and in this is also the opposition to marijuana in all of canada's its legalization was quebec he has raised to 21 the age at which you can buy marijuana mm. so that tapped into quebec sentiment but he seems to have been just put his finger right on what was necessary to get reelected. And we've got a surprising situation. The history of Quebec was Rouge against Bleu, a right wing party against the Liberals. That was the Conservatives against the Liberals, the Union Nationale, mm -hmm. then the PQ. Then suddenly a third party arose in the Action Democratique de Quebec with Mario Dumont, but they, they faded very quickly after becoming the opposition. So you've now got in Quebec, very interesting, in the first past the post model, four viable parties the Liberals, the CAQ, Solidaire, and the Parti Quebecois. Hmm. 
And the other thing that's interesting, Adam, and I do not understand this, he has pledged to have no referendum but legislation changing the electoral system. Hmm. Now, why would he do that? The great Adam, this was Ron's rule absolutely perfectly implemented. He got 43% of the vote and 76 seats in a 125-seat chamber. Ron's rules, 40% and the good split is power forever, really played into his hands. Why would he want to fiddle around with that? You know, you can't help but wonder <laughs> if he will find a convenient reason not to follow through on that promise when the day finally comes. Surprise, surprise, like Mr. Trudeau. Or, yeah, or indeed the process that we went through here in uh, the province of British Columbia. You know, no one has staged one of these referendums that have it gone well so far. It either comes no. back no or it comes back with an inconclusive result like in Prince Edward. Island. We're going to have a third go at it in Prince Edward Island when we have the <laughs> general election. Oh, boy. Oh, this this yeah. is a fun country if you look at it. Well, we probably only have a couple of minutes. so let's We have do, six minutes. Okay, six minutes. Let's do number two. We had Mr. Legault at 59%. Mm -hmm. Mr. Scott Moe, Mr. Moe, Scott Moe at 57% in Saskatchewan. Yes. Now, I've gone through my song and dance, and I won't go through it again. When you've got a very, very popular leader... You often get that leader replaced by a loser. Ike Smith, Frank Miller, Harry Frum in Alberta. You know that pattern? Yes. But this pattern, I think, is going to be broken by Mr. Moe. The first time I saw him on television, I thought, this guy's a winner. He's a great big burly guy, but he, he, he performs extremely well. And I hadn't followed that thing in Saskatchewan about scooping up little children, but he showed the sensitive side by having that ceremony of profoundly apologizing for what was called the scoop in the 60s. Oh, I don't the have... 60s scoop. Yeah, but he had a very, very heartwarming uh, apology. So, though he appears on the surface a kind of big, burly, tough Doug Ford sort of guy, he showed here a kind of more sensitive liberal touch, if I can put it that way. Yes. So the Mo is due to be re-elected, which I think he will be, in 2020. So uh, I think he looks like a winner to me. And um, so what you're going to have is probably another Saskatchewan government. And what's interesting about Saskatchewan, it's the only province I know of mm -hmm. where they're just the two parties. Yeah, because it's this is, the Saskatchewan party is sort of a liberal or a liberal conservative coalition type party. Absolutely. What happened was they kept losing the NDP under the Ron rule, 40 percent and a good split. And they said, well, we're going to no longer have the split. So every liberal and conservative MLA joined the Saskatchewan party, and they've been winning ever since, starting in 2007. Mm. Well, in, if we've got a couple of minutes, so I expect Mo to win. We're in B.C. Yes. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? John, John Horgan, actually, I saw him uh, getting protested the other day by, uh, uh, by actually NDP-affiliated politicians were in that crowd, which I found particularly interesting, including no fewer than two Green Party MLAs were in that crowd protesting at the legislature. Well, he's in a quite tricky situation. Yes. He loves that natural gas plant where they have to have that pipeline, which mm -hmm. has been controversial with arrests and so on. And yet, the other hand, he plays the environmental card. So he's sort of being caught in the middle. But what is very, very interesting there, as we know, we've done the recall thing. And by the way, on recall, Adam, you'll mm -hmm. be interested to know this. There's only one province in all of Canada that has recall legislation. Is it just us? And us. And w that was brought in at the dying days of social credit. It was part of a kind of a populist more in touch with the people kind of government. Mm. You know, we're more beholden to the people. So we're the only province. So we'll be watching that recall. I'm just fascinated by that. And by the way, in our little riding in Nanaimo, mm -hmm. a nominations closed on Wednesday, and we now have six candidates. We have uh, Ms. Ms. Ney of the Greens, Ms. Malcolmson of the NDP, Tony Harris of the Liberals, Libertarian Bill Walker, and Robin Richardson of the Vancouver Island Party. And advance voting January the 22nd to the 27th. So my youngest son, who's out of the country right now, works in Nanaimo with an engineering firm. He designs bridges and, um, and, uh, and wharfs. If you need a wharf built, he'll design it for you. And he lives just outside of the riding. But he'll be back today 
Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have him do a, a spy for me right through that Nanaimo riding to see who's winning the sign warfare. Now, in terms of uh, of the candidates that nominated, my understanding is that the, the B.C. Conservative Party and their, their, oh, their oh, deputy, I, they, they I, filed at the last moment, didn't they? I, I apologize. I, I'm an error. It's, uh, it's so wonderful you're right on the ball. Yes, Mr. Justin Greenwood. He's coming over from the mainland where he <laughs> resides, I believe, to represent uh, the party. Uh, 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 this, is, this is funny. That party must have about five people <laughs> he's the interim deputy leader i know it's there was there was a complicated uh, dispute in a leadership race and it led to extensive litigation and th- that whole story that would take an hour to go through well you know the smaller the party and the more irrelevant they are the more internal dissent have you, you know noticed? i have actually i have it's <laughs> yeah it's curious that's a kind of little mini mini wrong rule <laughs> well since you have no hope of defeating anybody else the only hope you have is to defeat someone in your own party but i'm deeply obliged to you for remembering <laughs> <laughs> i like that i'm gonna i'm gonna borrow that if you can't defeat any other parties then the the, the urge to defeat becomes internal and they start fighting each other well that's all you've got interesting isn't it? i just i never thought of it that way but it makes so much sense well i've Watch this time and again when you get these little mini irrelevant, and they fight each other more because there's no point otherwise unless you have an enemy. As you know, you always need an yep, enemy, yep. so you've got to find it within your own party. Oh, it's, it's why I enjoy these conversations so much. We're, we're all out of time, but we'll have to pick this up again next okay, week, we all right? One, one sentence, just to finish, Mr. Horgan is at 43%, and we'll wait with breathless anticipation what happens in Nanaimo because if the NDP loses that it's a tie in the legislature and Mr. Plekis would have to break the tie but will Mr. Plekis survive the recall? Lots of fun ahead Adam. Yes it is. Thank you so much for your, your time as always. Talk to you next week. Uh, okay, bye bye. Uvic Professor Emeritus of Law and Political Science at the University of Victoria, Professor Ron Cheffins every Friday here on CFAX 1070. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. Good morning. It's 1130. I'm James Gardner with CFAX 1070 News. Well, a group of volunteers from Victoria are staging a fundraising breakfast to help a North Cowichan family whose home was smashed by a tree in the December 20th windstorm. Lester Joe and his family of six have been living in a motel ever since. And to add insult to injury, their home was burglarized after the storm. Someone broke into the house, they got into one of the windows, and they uh, stole some things from us, like uh, a brand new generator that was still in a box, and some money over $300 in cash, and presents that were wrapped yet. Joe says he's running out of money as he waits for an insurance payout and is grateful for the kindness of those trying to help. The pancake breakfast will take place at the Rainbow Kitchen in Esquimalt from 9.30 to 11 a.m. tomorrow. 100% of the funds raised will help the family. Breakfast is by donation. Vice President Mike Pence is pledging that the Trump administration will keep fighting to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. Pence made that commitment during what was meant to be a morale-boosting appearance at the Washington headquarters for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. CBP agents are among the 800,000 federal employees who must work without pay during what is on track to become the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. The CRTC and CBC are asking Ottawa to ensure Netflix, YouTube and Amazon Prime pay their share of producing Canadian content. In written submissions to a government panel this week, Both the broadcast regulator and public broadcaster also called for new rules that encourage news content distributors to ensure they deliver accurate and trustworthy information. The submissions are part of a wide-scale review of Canada's Broadcasting Act, Telecommunications Act, and Radio Communication Act that was started last June. CPAC's 1070 weather. It is going to clear to sunshine for the weekend ahead. Mainly cloudy today, though, with a high of uh, 11 degrees. And then a few clouds tonight, a low of 5. And then sunny skies tomorrow, a high of 11. Sunshine on Sunday and a high of 8. Right now in Victoria, it's mostly cloudy. It's currently 9 degrees. I'm James Gardner. If it's happening, it's here on CPAC's 1070. It's 1133. Fuel your mind on the drive home. Weekday afternoons with Mark Brené from 3 to 6. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070.
Jim Sterling on CFAX 1070. All right, we are going to cap the show this week for our final half hour, taking a look at some of the fun new toys that are being unveiled at the Consumer Electronics Show that takes place place each and every year uh that that big new thing all of the neat new electronics before we actually see them in the stores before we actually see them in our, our friends homes and if we're, we're lucky and we have some extra money in our pockets perhaps even our own homes we hear about it at trade shows such as this alan perry hosts tech talk at cfax 1070 by the way alan's been going to this for 17 years 17 years, Alan. I'm jealous. I'm, I'm quite frankly jealous. We're going to be chatting with Alan Perry coming up later on in the segment. But first, I want to welcome on someone who is also taking in the trade show this year. It's the tech department manager at London Drugs, Dan Williamson, joining us. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you this morning? Oh, I'm doing great, Adam. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So, so tell me, is there anything more magical than the look on Alan's face when you get him in a room with all that technology? Oh, it's like a kid in a candy shop. It's awesome. It is. I wish I could just bottle that feeling and give it to the world. I think everything would would be better if we could. Uh, Got to ask you, what are we seeing that's new, that's big, that's fantastic in Las Vegas this year? There are so many different products, Adam. There's a whole range of new 8K TVs, if you can even imagine 8K. I mean, we just got over the whole 4K thing. Mm. Um, There are so many different products from a bunch of startups to big players like Sony. Um, They've got their second iteration of their Ivo uh, dog, the little robotic pets that you can have for those people that aren't allowed to have actual dogs. Uh, But the big trend this year is huge on AI. So everything has artificial intelligence. Everything is going to be connected to 5G, faster wireless uh, connection. And that's really the the huge trend for things uh, here at CES. So when when we talk about artificial intelligence, AI, it's a word that gets thrown around all the time. It's in fiction. It's in fact. What do we actually mean when we say artificial intelligence is big at the electronics show this year? What does that mean? So a lot of the things now are being programmed with platforms that can learn. So they get a bunch of data, and based on that data, they can make predictive models on how an image is supposed to look. Uh, NVIDIA is a great example of a company that's utilizing this um, AI platform in the background. It's called Deep Learning, Mm -hmm. and it learns and adapts and changes its behavior based on um, feedback. So, yes, this is what it's supposed to look like. Uh, And we're seeing that integration integrated into a great deal of electronic products now. Now, in terms of what it's supposed to look like in feedback, well, what do you mean? Like, I don't, I don't fully understand. So you have maybe two images side by side, and one is your sort of your starting point. Yeah. Um, based on maybe some images that you've taken at high resolution, that's what your end point, you, where you want to be, is. Mm-hmm. And you can train the electronics to, to get to that end point. On on its own. So if I if I sort of the new. Mm -hmm. So sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. So if I like my pictures a certain way, like I always make them brighter or I always do a certain modification to them, the computer will learn my preferences, and without me telling it to do it, it'll just sort of start doing it because it thinks that's what I want it to do. That's correct. And if it receives feedback from you that, hey, no, actually, let's go along this route instead, that that's not what I intended, it will learn from that and adapt and the next time hopefully get that right. That's actually really interesting. When we think of machines that we have that almost work the way that we want, but we have to do a tedious extra step each and every time. So the machine watches us. It watches what we do. It watches how we use it and says, you know what? Life would be a lot easier if I just did this step by, by myself as the machine. How does, it, how does it know what to do and what not to do, though? Do we know? Very, very complex algorithms that we're yeah. not going to get into here. Well, that's what I always wonder about, right, is it's all well and good for the machine to, to help be helpful, but we all know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and human beings that are trying to be helpful can sometimes cause all sorts of problems. So I almost, I'm almost afraid at what my computer might do trying to help me if it makes a mistake. What do you think of that? Well, 
I think that in order to make any sort of progress, I, there's going to be, it's, it's like taking baby steps. I mean, yeah. you're, you're sort of toddling along and eventually you can, you can learn to, to walk at a faster pace or even run. Um, I think we're, we're sort of in its infancy, but seeing some of the technology that's out there now and, and what it's capable of, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful. I'm pretty, so, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So to boil things down, to think of AI, artificial intelligence, to boil it down for the average person out there, it's the way the machine works will actually subtly change over time, and it will change in a way that it believes is more convenient for you. Is that a fair way to put it? That's exactly it. Okay. That's, that's great. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll watch for that. What are what are some of the other things that you're seeing out there? What about, I'm looking at here, I'm looking at smart bike helmets. Why would I want a smart bike helmet? Well, especially in in a city like Victoria, where where I'm based in, where yeah. where we live, mm -hmm. um, the number of cyclists that it, it's sometimes difficult to decide what direction they're going, whether it's right or left, or sometimes they don't necessarily know the correct hand signal to use, mm -hmm. or the driver may not be able to correctly interpret that that turn signal. Mm -hmm. So, what um, companies like Cosmo um, that are, are based out of uh, Paris, France, have done is they've designed a device that will uh, attach to your existing helmet or even just yourself. There's, yeah. there's a variety of different attachments for this thing um, that will indicate uh, braking. So, it has a GPS and accelerometer in it that will detect whether you are slowing down and apply a red light to the device to huh. indicate that you're braking, wow. but also uh, turn signals too. So if you want to turn right, you want to turn left, it will indicate the lights on the right side, the lights on the left side How? to show which direction you're going. Uh, okay, I understand the accelerometer. It detects how much G-force as we, as we slow down our car. We feel that. You can have machines measure that. How would it know where I want to turn? Do I have to tell it or does it know somehow? Because that, be, that would be freaky. <laughs> no, for the, the right and left turn signals, those are manually done with okay. uh, a little gadget that attaches on either the handlebar or um, in your pocket, a little remote. All right, so it's not that good yet. Because I guess the idea is that we want a computer assistant that gives us what we need when we need it without having to do the mental labor of trying to tell it exactly what to do. Because we've all been in the situation where you're trying to tell somebody who doesn't know how to do a job how to do it properly. And it's usually just fast to say, hold on, just move out of the way i'll do it myself that's what i find myself doing with electronic assistance it's yeah you're helpful but you're dumb so get out of the way i can do it myself faster than siri can figure out what i'm trying to tell it to do what we need is machines that actually are helpful and are predictive do we see any of that yet mm -hmm. oh well i think we're starting to definitely see that yeah. um going back to sony's ivo for instance um this little dog mm -hmm. will recognize who its owner is based on interactions and will learn tricks. Um, you can um, basically have a, a range of expressions that this thing can, can display based on your interactions with it. It's so learning. How, how big is this? So it's a, it's a dog, it's your friend, but it's a robot. How big is it? Uh, it's roughly about a foot tall. Okay. Um, about a foot by foot. It's a little... Yeah, it's kind of like a little toy dog. But, but it's not like it's not like a micro machine because I've seen I've seen little robots no. like that that sort of look at you. So this thing, it's got a camera on it. It's a robot dog. Does it have wheels? Does it have legs? How does it get around? No, it actually has twenty two different points of um, sort of joint <laughs> movement. So oh, okay. it actually mimics really well realistic dog movement. Wow, I thought you were going to tell me it had twenty two legs and it was like a terrifying centipede or something. And I said, no, not in my house. I'm not letting that thing in my house. I don't care if it's a friend. <laughs> Um, so it actually has legs. Like it actually walks like a dog, because that is kind of cool. Yeah, it walks. It rolls over. It huh. uh, it can play with a ball. It can play with a bone. It has uh, a huge number of expressions that it can display on its face with these organic LED uh, eyes, which is sort of new with this iteration over the one that we saw the prototype last year. Uh, and they're they're really they're really cute. The problem <laughs> Adam, they're really cute. Well, okay, but I just said you said it had 22, and I pictured something with 22 legs on it, like this sort of spider thing coming along. I'm like. Okay, I'm not, I'm not buying one of those. I don't care if it's called Ibo. Uh, so it's a dog. It's a friendly dog. It's got a camera in it, so it knows your face, uh, uh, other people. The one thing I always worry about, though, Diane, and
and, and this is our, our final question because we got to let you go because we're going to shift over to Alan. Um, for all of these AI machines, they have to, in order to learn, you have to record information, visual information, audio information, input data. That data usually doesn't stay on the machine. It usually goes somewhere on the Internet. How concerned are you about privacy? <laughs> I think with the whole privacy thing, we can't really get away from it. I mean, even if you don't own a device, Somebody around you is going to. Uh, there's lots of security methods in, in place, and I think, really, they do a very good job of protecting us. I mean, Apple's a great example. They have a, a great billboard advertisement right now, um, right outside, that says they would happens in Vegas stays in Vegas basically what happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone um, lot, these companies are very cognizant of people's privacy concerns and do put in place a, a great deal of measures to protect that privacy Diane Williams is the tech department manager at London Drug Saanich Center also a, freak, a frequent contributor I should say to CFAX 1070's Tech Talk Diane have fun great talking to you all right. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. Take care. Bye now. We are going to shift over. Alan Perry is there as well. I always love to hear the glee in his voice. You put Alan with technology, and it's, it's really a magic thing. Uh, 17 years he has been attending the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. I remember Alan telling me about 4K TVs. I said, what's 4K? He goes, Adam, you won't believe it. And I have to admit, it looked amazing when I first saw 4K. Now, 4K just looks like normal TV. And the HD TV that used to look amazing, it looks like horrible garbage. Because all of us are getting spoiled. How much technological advancement will it take to keep this new and interesting? Or are we doomed to disappointment because we are becoming more sophisticated as consumers of electronic devices? That question and more coming up. Stay with us. Let Well Spray Tours help you soak away the winter blues and rejuvenate. Visit Harrison Hot Springs Resort and Spa before heading to Vancouver for Sen Yen, an amazing presentation of classical Chinese storytelling through dance and music. Vancouver is the only Canadian stop west of Toronto where you can see this colorful and incredible performance. So don't miss out. Find out more at wellspraytours.com. A world to experience. Until January 13th at Lowe's, it's the Buy More, Save More event. And until January 16th, get free delivery and haul away on all major appliances. See store or Lowe's.ca. A new year calls for a fresh start. If you resolve to get out of debt this year, talk to Blair Manson of Sands & Associates. Not only is Blair a licensed insolvency trustee, he's a good guy with valuable advice. Thanks, Shorty. At Sands & Associates, we help people get out of debt in the simplest, most pain-free way possible. Your fresh start begins with a no-charge, no-obligation conversation. No charge, no obligation. Told you he was a good guy. Visit sands-trustee.com. Parker Johnston Roofing has taken care of Victoria's residential roofing needs since 1950. That's nearly 70 years and three generations of experience they use to complete any project. Being in the roofing business for that many years has taught them that when you want a roof done right, you go to a firm with unparalleled quality and an established history of company service before, during, and after the job is complete. Visit ParkerJohnstonRoofing.com for more information and to request a free estimate. Parker Johnston. Hi, Jeffrey here for Barclays Fine Jewelers. We want you to start the year looking and feeling great. So now until the end of the month, we offer your diamond jewelry a complimentary spa treatment. Each piece will receive a rejuvenating rub on the polishing wheel, luxurious soak in our ultrasonic bath, followed by a steam. We'll also check for any loose stones. Your treasured pieces will be ready for you the next day at no charge to you. We call it Shine and Sparkle, and we look forward to seeing you here at Barclays Fine Jewelers in Oak Bay Village, online at Barclays jewelers.com did you know that up to 50 percent of heating and cooling energy can be lost through your windows at rafal and brown window fashions we carry the most energy saving product from hunter douglas duet honeycomb cellular shades on sale now for a limited time with rebates starting at a hundred dollars on these hunter douglas energy efficient shades visit rafal browncom today to book your free in-home consultation Rising shades for At Sydney All Care Residence, we care. It's as simple as that. We care about your well-being, your health, your happiness, and your social life. Our residents are family, and no matter the situation, we'll do what we can to make moments matter. You might even say that at Sydney All Care Residence, all care, we care, I care. Sydney All Care Residence, 
privately offering long-term and palliative care. Learn more at allcarecanada.ca. Four Seasons Heating and Cooling offers high-efficiency Daikin gas furnaces. Their intelligent system means improved comfort and lower energy bills. Ask about Fortis BC rebates available for eligible models. For all the right reasons, get in touch with Four Seasons. FourSeasonsHeating.com. CTV News at 6 with Andrew Johnson. Weeknights on CTV Vancouver Island. Making the unpredictable predictable. Local weather all day. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. It's Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. All right, let's keep rolling. Consumer Electronics Show CES in Las Vegas, Nevada. Always a hotbed of the latest and greatest tech that's coming our way. Some of it becomes widely adopted. Everybody's got HD TVs now and streaming and 4K TVs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of it, though, just never comes to fruition at all. Alan Perry down there trying to, to find the sort of the needles in the haystack or the diamonds in the rough, maybe, is the way I should word it, Alan. Tell me, how much fun? you having this week so what's this about me ordering you a robot <laughs> well here's the thing here's the thing the ibo i'm trying to i haven't actually seen a picture of the ibo yet i've seen a picture of a very small autonomous little dog shaped thing on a table that looks at, at people and and it has an artificial intelligence in it so for some reason that was in my brain when we were talking about the sony ibo and i was talking with with our, our previous guest who's down there there with you uh, diane williamson and, and i asked about the ibo and i said is it like a dog that walks around or does it have wheels and it's just shaped like a dog and she says it has 24, and I thought she was going to tell me it had 24 legs. And I pictured this, yeah, this I was listening on centipede the thing. Was yeah. Yes. No, keep that out of my go house, Alan. When you, get off, when you get off the air, Adam, or anybody, go to YouTube and search for A-I-B-O. I mean, I'm a guy, and I will say the word that I don't normally say, the C word. It is cute. It is cute. Look at that. Is, is it very yeah. cute? Because I've seen pictures of little cute, friendly AI things, and I just I, I was hoping that it didn't look like a horrible centipede monster. Well, but here's the useful part of this, and that's why you send us down here to look for the useful thing. Imagine if you live somewhere yeah. where you're not allowed to have a dog, or imagine if you are allergic to a dog. It's a great companion for seniors. Maybe their spouse has passed away. They've now downsized. They're living in a care environment where they can't have a dog. This thing would be awesome for that. But do you ever have that moment where the suspension of disbelief breaks and you realize that you're talking to a machine? Not really. We no. played with them. And yeah. yeah, they're very engaging. They really are because they do things, some things that the dog can't do. You know, they, yeah, they, they roll over and they make sounds. And the more you tickle their tummy, the more they remember that it's you. That's, that's, that's interesting. So where does the data actually go? Am I, am I giving all of my, my information to a corporation? Probably. It's, it's Sony. So, no, most of it stays internally inside the chips. They've got, okay. that's why they're so expensive. They've got a lot of chips inside them compared to any other one we've seen. Okay. So, AI, the big thing that is at the Consumer Electronics Show this year, we've got robot dogs. What else are we looking at? Well, the one that I want to thought that you'd be most interesting, because you and I had this conversation last year when I was telling you about 4K TVs yes. and OLED, and you got a choice. Do you spend the extra money on getting the OLED instead of the LCD, or do you spend the extra money on getting the 4K instead of the HD? And those came together between then and now, and so a lot of people got them for Boxing Week or Black Friday. But now we're on to 8K TVs, and the people that are making the sets are astounded that the content creators didn't see this coming this fast. So only Amazon and Netflix have announced plans to offer 8K content this year. You can find 8K videos on YouTube. So the really big deal about this, which is why we come here, every manufacturer down to the TCLs, the Hisense, and the Kenworths out of China, which have been largely up to now doing copies cheaper, they've all got 8K but only the top three brands, LG, Samsung, and Panasonic, have the artificial intelligence chips that can upscale older content to make it look really good. Because when you look at a standard, like you've got a VHS video from the wedding from low those decades ago, it's painful to watch when the quality of the set is that good. But with the AI they actually saw a demo. We're going to talk to one of the officials from LG on the show tomorrow. And the demo was that. It was very, very watchable. And watching regular TV broadcast, HD, 
and 4K stuff, it upscales beautifully to 8K. So I'm just, it's coming yeah. really quickly. I'm just trying to figure out how those algorithms would work. So it would look at a set of frames that are all pixelated, and it would work backwards to try to figure out how if you took a sharper image and then downgraded it, what are the odds that the sharper image would create that pixelated picture? And from that, it works backwards to try to construct something that's four times as sharp? Precisely. So the curve of your face, which is really jagged on an old lower resolution version, it actually adds in pixels. And with the AI chips and the speed of it, it actually gives you a smooth curve on your face. So, so it's it guessing. Really, they put, yeah, it's guessing, but it's guessing incredibly quickly. And we were, frankly, really impressed how incredibly accurately. That's interesting. So in terms of data with 4K and 8K, because an 8K TV is essentially four 4K TVs stacked, you know, one on top of the other and then two beside them in terms of, of the amount of data, the amount of pixels. But what we're increasingly seeing is that the data that comes in isn't necessarily eight times the data. It's a chip that takes what it's given and then tries to guess what the sharper image would look like. Exactly. So if you've got an 8K source, then the chip can just go to sleep, yeah. nothing for it to do. But if you've got a 4K HD or, God forbid, SD, then it really works hard. And these chips have come down to the point that they were previously unaffordable. But now, eh, okay, sure. Here's but the thing, Al. The big yeah. three have got those. Yeah. Here's the thing. Is I remember when, when HD came out, you know, 1080 Progressive. And that was, that was a big deal. It was like, wow, this looks amazing. You know what, Alan? You go back and you watch SD now. It looks like horrible garbage. Are we getting spoiled? Well, yes, but we get used to stuff so quickly. Yeah. Funny you mentioned that. It's like you were eavesdropping because we were looking at all these uh, 8K sets, and then we walked by one of the booths that's showing the really nice 4K OLED, and we're going, yeah, that's good, but your brain gets so used to this awesome new thing very quickly that, yes, we are being spoiled, but spoiled in a good way. All right. Alan Perry, we've got a couple of minutes left. What else has really stood out for you while we wrap this up? I found a couple little things. The reason I love coming here is the little gems. One, we're literally going to go and do the test after we get off the air with you, and they're going to join us on the air tomorrow. This is a Chinese company that's developed earbuds that translate live on the fly. So if I go to Spain, I can open the little case. They just look like Apple AirPods. Yeah. I, put one in the, I put one in the ear of the fellow who doesn't speak English. I put the other one in me, and we just converse. There's a... They say there's a one to two second delay when you say, you know, several sentences together. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try it out. And, there, and if these work the way they're expected to, they won the Innovations Award, 220 bucks, And you can, it's like the Star Trek Universal Translator. So we're going to test those out. One that I did already find and I think is awesome. There's a bunch of products, including ones that you can go down to Best Buy or London Drugs and buy. They will detect a water leak. So if your water heater bursts or your water uh -huh. overflows. They'll send you a text. That's really cool, except Adam's on the air at CFAX and at his home in Souk, and now he knows that he's got to go. <laughs> well, okay, it'll... Here's the deal. No, but RCA's got yeah, one, yeah. 150 bucks, yeah. and it's a bracket that goes over top of the hot water switch down by the hot water heater, and when it detects a leak, it flips the switch. Okay, it that's It physically useful. moves the handle. That's very useful. That is very and useful. And then it texts you to tell you that your water leader leaked, but I turned it off and you're fine. Wow. Isn't that cool? That is actually really cool. Alan Perry, pleasure as always, host of Tech Talk. Looking forward to tomorrow's show. 10.05 till noon, and then repeat on Sunday. All right. Alan Perry, thank you for your time as always. Have fun. Take care. Okay, bye now. That's Alan Perry, host of Tech Talk on CFAX 1070. You got robot dogs, you got artificial intelligence. Hey, Joe, how you doing? And you got Joe Perkins. Don't you have one of those litter boxes that they were talking about the other day that self-cleans itself? I actually don't even have a personal life, Joe. Nobody's sure. <laughs> no, I want to talk about this. <laughs> Adam, you have one what? of these ridiculous litter boxes that, that self-cleans every 30 days, right? Well, you know, I, uh, I might. I don't know. Some people could say that I, that I did. I like to... That's pretty it cool. Well, what I do is I always lie to people about my personal life, and I tell radically different stories because I want them to be very confused when they try to compare notes and think that the other one's lying. I have no clue what you, what you do out, <laughs> out, outside of the studio. I have, someone said, so what, what does Adam like to do? I, I, I have no clue. 
Oh. I don't know where he goes. I don't know what he what? does, but well, I'm, I'm I know ev- from 9 to 12 he's here. I am everywhere and nowhere. I'm usually up to something, and it's usually terrifyingly imaginative. Uh, what's on your show today? Friday Free For All, and last week it was just Matt Hyland and myself. Uh, this week the boys are back. Catherine's going to be here. I said yesterday, you know, the boys are back, and Catherine, well, I'm here too, and I, I went, you're right. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that, but then she said, well, I'm one of the guys. I'm and yeah, you're one of the boys. So, I'm one of the boys. Yeah, the boys are back. Catherine's here. Andrew, Dan. Dan McIntosh, the Friday Free For All. Uh, we're going to discuss, uh, you know, it's still early on in this new year. We'll talk resolutions. I haven't heard if they're making any. We'll open up the phone lines and just have a little bit of a chit chat. They're, they're already gone. It's been 11 days. Nobody's still doing most are, I, No, but seriously, most resolutions are done by now, aren't they? Yeah, pretty much. More than half, I think, the yeah. studies show. Yeah, it's just easier not to try. <clears throat> I'm Adam Sterling. He's Joe Perkins. News is next. With cooler weather comes complexity in your wine. Overlapping flavors highlighted by warm aromas and tightly scented notes. Certain wines just work better at certain times. Save on Foods carries over 1,200 VQA labels from more than 160 vineyards around our province. And with new ones added daily, that perfect pairing is never far off. Wines of British Columbia at Save on Foods. Available at select Campbell River and Parksville locations. Browse the entire collection at saveonfoods.com. Winter, winter, see what we have in store. Hi, it's Michael here for Windsor Plywood in the West Shore. We have everything you need for your floors. If you're renovating your home or building brand new, we've got you covered. We offer total and complete installations, and we do them quickly, too. Get in touch today to learn about the latest flooring trends. That's at Windsor Plywood West Shore, your installation specialist. Windsor, Windsor, the experts you need to know. Catherine Cardinal is dead. CTV's landmark series returns. Do you doubt that Catherine took her own life? He lost his wife. I want you to take the lead. He's not ready. Now he stands to lose everything else. You cannot open up an investigation all by yourself. This is just his way of coping. I have to do this lead. Because there's nothing more dangerous than a broken man. Stop! With power. Cardinal Season 3, streaming Thursday at 9 on CTV. CFAX Victoria. An iHeart radio station. If it's happening, it's here. CFAX 1070. Good afternoon. This is Victoria at noon for Friday, January 11th. For Thrifty Foods, I'm James Gardner. We're getting early reports of a missing hiker in Goldstream Provincial Park. And the opposition liberals are chiming in about B.C. government's latest transportation plans. And I'm Kyle Reynolds on the CFAX Sports Desk. The Royals and Grizzlies are both set for three game weekends. And UVic is urging basketball fans to support a great cause tonight. All that to come on Victoria at noon, but first. Search crews have been called to Goldstream Provincial Park for a report of a missing hiker. Details are still pretty, pretty scarce at this point, but the search is focused in the vicinity of the trestle. It's unknown how long the hiker has been missing, along with search and rescue. RCMP and Langford fire crews are assisting. We'll keep you posted on any emerging details on this story. Well, it's not unusual for people to use Mount Doug Park as their illegal dumping grounds. An incident this week has refocused attention on the damaging practice. On Tuesday, what appears to be a full suite of furniture, including sofas, tables, chairs, shelving, and drawers, was found dumped in the bush. The mess required intensive cleanup by parks staff, and that plus the cost of disposal will have to come from the park budget. The incident angers Daryl Wick, director of the Friends of Mount Doug Park Society. Why they would go to the effort, and, and it was a serious effort, to haul this furniture so far into the park, trampling all the bush and ferns and so forth there, it, it's beyond me. I don't know if they're trying to make a statement or what. I, I couldn't figure that out. And it's the first time we've seen this sort of, well, I have to call it just flagrant uh, vandalism. Well, some have suggested more signage to discourage illegal activities. Wick calls for more education so that the public will realize every act, large or small, combines to damage the park environment. B.C. opposition liberals say the governing NDP government is dragging its feet on a plan to improve transportation on southern Vancouver Island. The province announced Wednesday the plan will focus on existing and future multimodal infrastructure projects going as far north as Duncan and as far west as Souk. It also includes plans to explore an emergency detour route over the Malahat. 
between the West Shore communities and Duncan. However, Michelle Stilwell, Liberal MLA for Parksville Qualicum, says what we're seeing here is a typical NDP strategy of delaying and studying to avoid making any decisions. There's already a plan in place with the South Island Prosperity Project. They've been working on it for years. They have the municipalities on board. They have um, businesses on board. They, they, they've done the work. Stillwell says the answer to improving transportation on the South Island is not paying consultants to do work that's already been done. The NDP needs to get on board and work with the South Island Prosperity Project. A day after a deal was struck between Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and the RCMP, work is set to begin on a natural gas pipeline through the B.C. First Nations Territory. The site has been the center of growing tensions in a dispute over the pipeline and indigenous claims to the land. A convoy of work trucks accompanied senior officers in the RCMP's indigenous liaison to a work camp to dismantle barriers that had blocked workers from starting the Coastal GasLink project. You're listening to Victoria at Noon on CFAX 1070. I'm James Gardner. It's coming up to 12.04. Ninety chickens on the lamb yesterday are now roosting at the CRD Pound. Don Brown, Chief Bylaw Officer with the CRD's Animal Care Services, says... They don't know how they ended up on the road, though. Hopefully it's not a case that someone's just gone around and dumped them, but uh, you know, they're, they're still laying. I mean, these are typical, very common laying uh, hens, but uh, you know, even the, uh, when we loaded them up in the trucks, the, uh, they were still laying eggs, eggs inside the back of the truck. One bird had to be euthanized, though. Brown says the chickens will be up for adoption next week. The official age of retirement is creeping upwards in most countries as governments wrestle to balance pensions and public finances. CFAX 1070's Lisa Best compares Canadian workers with their peers around the world. While many governments want us to work till age 67, the age most people actually retire varies depending on where you live. Australians are among the first to head to the garden or the golf course. The average age of retirement down under is about 54. In France, most retire around 60. Norwegians finish work just shy of 67. Japan retires around age 70. And South Korea has the longest working life of just over 72 years, mostly due to the number of seniors living in poverty. Most Canadians retire around age 65, even though they can begin drawing CPP at age 60. Lisa Bassey, Facts 1070 News. The country's highest court has ruled a law that stripped Canadians who lived abroad for more than five years of their voting rights was unconstitutional. The country's top court has determined the law already overturned by the Trudeau government wasn't justified. A pair of Canadians living in the U.S. filed suit claiming the now-defunct law violated their charter rights. An 18-year-old Saudi asylum seeker who fled alleged abuse by her family will soon call Canada home. Speaking with reporters in Regina, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau confirming that Canada will comply with the U.N.'s request to welcome Rahaf Mohammed Alquin as a refugee. Alquin made waves with her social media campaign calling for asylum from behind a barricaded hotel do a door in Thailand. She was stopped by immigration police in Bangkok while trying to get to Australia.